B U double L S H I T. New word. A R T I S T. Bell's bullshit artist. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you thought we'd forgotten about you. You thought we'd forgotten how to record. You thought we'd forgotten that podcasting exists. But no, all those celebrities out there had to remind us by suddenly going, oh, look, there's this thing called podcasting. Let's jump on that particular bandwagon that these motherfuckers have been doing for years, very proficiently, I might add, and with better audio quality than the fucking BBC output right now. Not that I'm wound up about anything. Hello, welcome to Bullshit Eyes. I am Boz, and I am joined, as ever, by my wonderful bromance brother course <laughs> well hello and my goodness that diatribe i just don't know how to even follow that up <laughs> i think i haven't done this in a while that just all came out none of that was planned <laughs> yeah well i mean if you really think about it it's very much an accurate thing you know that we we have serious uh grievances with celebrities on this because they're all stuck at home and they're bored and they're not getting the adulation that they want and now they're stealing ours yeah yeah you know this sort of this this backdoor way of getting your um bullshit out there we we've been doing for over 10 years like, oh look podcasting exists like, i mean they hijacked it a few years ago anyway i'm not that butthurt but it is like <laughs> it is a wash right now but i did put a comment on my facebook a while back because everybody like at the bbc especially who are so known for their high standards and public broadcasting corporation and all that kind of thing and they're all stuck in their fucking houses having to dial in to do their comedy shows their news broadcasts everything not a single one of them knows how to just put a fucking duvet on a clothes rack behind them to kill the echo in the room none of them can achieve good audio and i'm listening to radio fucking four which is so i don't know if you know about bbc radio stations you've got radio one which is for all the millennials you've got to be under 30 to listen to it basically to even give a shit um, so that, that's the really hipster sort of new channel. Then you've got Radio 2, which is everybody up to about 50, but they only play songs. They, like, they forgot music was made after 1985. So they play music basically from about 1975 to 1985, and they do the same damn shows over. They've got the same hosts who they have to dig up out of a grave every morning to get them on the air, um, and they do this mix of sort of bad chat and music, and then you've got Radio 4, which is no music, news, topical, art, talking about classical composers here and there, <clears throat> literary works of this, Desert Island Discs, all very posh. Um, and it sounds like shit right now, which just made me so happy. What's really bizarre about that is they have all of these engineers that set up all this stuff and they do all of these real serious work. And they, you know, they, they build the room in such a way as to make sure that they have sound reinforcement sound absorption they have diffusion panels they create pop filters the way that they're supposed to for the microphones and they will actually like an actual like sound engineer in a radio station worth their salt will actually take the time and gear up a studio specifically for the people that are supposed to be in that studio now some of them may take a tact where they'll use like just the best of everything they can get their hands on or just the most flat response of everything they can get their hands on and don't really sweeten it up or anything like that. But like a mm. radio engineer that's worth their salt will make sure that the people that they are miking and getting set up to be able to do the DJ work, it's geared towards their specific voice to catch their specific voice range, their affectation, and to be able to make it to where the plosives and all the other stuff work. And mm. unfortunately with podcasting, most people just buy... And I'm going to probably step on some fucking toes here. Most people just buy a USB connected <laughs> blue microphone and call it a day and think that that's all they need. And that's not the case yeah. because you know what? Those microphones aren't as great as everybody thinks they are. Oh my God. I hate them. I, I had one for a while and I fucking, I gave it away. <clears throat> it drove me fucking crazy because you had to turn the gain to virtually zero to kill any room echo. Um, and then you had to be right on top of it. So then you can hear every breath. I mean, this shit isn't easy. I mean, and of course, I've realized I've set myself up because if there's even the slightest blemish now on my audio going into this podcast, right. if I breathe too much into the mic, right. I haven't got my pop shield on. I'm going to say that right now because I've got no fucking idea where it is right now, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've set myself up for a real kicking. But you're right. Like these engineers could ring the people who are like, oh, you know that radio show you did yesterday? That sounded like shit. 
put a duvet on a clothes rack put it right close up behind you i mean like my setup is i've put stuck cheap foam i bought on fucking wish.com or wherever it was on the wall in front of me i've got a black sheet with red soundproofing badly sewn to it hung over a clothes rack that i wheel up behind my chair to stop the rebound of the noise to so i don't get the echo um i mean there's still some it's you know because i haven't deadened the whole room it's not a sound cord uh sound booth but it's like it's just a bit of effort honestly but no it just makes me chuckle i i don't really care i, I still enjoy their output but I'm just thinking, yeah. Well, uh, us, I, us low red podcasters. I don't even want to talk about <laughs> all of the money that I spent. Although I've said it on my show already on Cinema Psyop, so I might as well mention it here. I got a little bit of extra money left over where I had like almost a whole quarter of college that was funded um, oh, that right. I ended up not needing. Hmm. So my student loan debt, portions of that is actually my studio. <laughs> <laughs> I spent nice. some money on my studio. Now it's probably not nearly as much as what other people are thinking, but um I, I found a uh, a factory direct website where it's a soundproofing foam factory uh like a or, or a factory that makes foam, you know, like all sorts of right. different types of foam. And one of the things they mm. specialize in is the high density foam that is used for um soundproofing. And I bought like a couple of packages from them that were like really inexpensive. I did the math. I tried to figure it out, you know, because I've seen the stuff on how it goes for Amazon and Wish and all the other mm. kind of stuff. And I went the route. I mean, this is probably going to shock everybody, but I went the route of the really obsessive engineer. And I <laughs> sat down and I tried to figure out how to kill the echo and what I was dealing with. And I tried to do the math. I failed miserably at it. Um, but I like I tried to like I, I you you could have seen me like one of those uh, memes where like someone's calculating and they're looking around and like Pythagorean theorem pops up and all this other stuff is everywhere. Like yes. that was me trying to figure it out. You know, like I'm just trying. Yeah, and I can so imagine you doing that. <laughs> no, seriously, I sat down with like a piece of paper and a calculator and like all of these different things, like trying to figure out the angles and what I needed to do. And then I found some blog somewhere. I can't remember what it was or like a sound engineer's post where he's like, look, you really don't need to do all of that. This is, these are your hotspots. These are the areas in a room that you need to worry about. And if you're dealing with these kinds of surfaces where it's reflections, then just start using clap tests and see where the echo comes in. And a clap test yeah. is very simple. You literally clap as loud as you can and point the sound wave of your clap at a corner of a room or a wall in a room or basically where you'd be talking. And when you hear the echo, then you know the area where you need to get some coverage. And the thing that's mm. really interesting is to be able to do this coverage, you don't have to do 100%, although some people do with soundproofing, or sound absorption, I should say, because there's nothing you can really do to soundproof aside from oh, yeah. decoupling a room mm. completely with uh, vi <laughs> like vibration-resistant, uh, uh, like high-density vinyl material where you know the boards are sitting on top of that and then that absorbs the sound and all that kind of stuff and then sound absorbing on top of that and diffusion <laughs> but mm. um the clo that's going silly yeah yeah not like my friend did <clears throat> who built a recording studio and was told that the best way for sound insulation was to do a cavity wall with two layers of bricks so thinking, okay and then fill the cavity with sand oh yeah that'd do it yeah because um even though the bricks would no. reflect the sound a little bit <laughs> the sand would probably absorb no, <laughs> it transmitted. It was awful. Ah, uh, <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> see, what a lot of people don't realize, though, is like there are some materials that you would think would be very reflexive, but are actually quite sound absorbent. Like, for instance, glass. <laughs> Panes of glass can actually mm, be very yeah. sound absorbent. And the reason for that is we don't know this, but gla like most people don't know this or even think about this, but glass is actually a very, very viscous liquid. That's why old glass is always very thick at the bottom and very thin at the top, because it's slowly gravity pulling it down. Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, you think all recording studios have that big, massive area of glass right in the middle of the fucking room. I mean, it can't be that bad, can it? Right. But actually, the, weirdly, the, the problem I have here and the re echo you're probably hearing is that just because this is a multi-purpose setup, it's also my work desk. I've got a massive... 20 plus however many inch iMac and then a slightly smaller iMac next to that with a 42 inch TV above that so I've got this huge area of glass <laughs> in front of me and if I'm really being obsessive about the audio I will sling a sheet over each of those screens um, which will kill the bounce back a little bit but it's like yeah I'm 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 not I'm not radio fucking four I don't care that much <laughs> well <laughs> I know you do <laughs> right well and so when I f when I finally got this this thing with the clap test and all of that I just kind of figured out what I'm like okay well my hottest spots on the walls are going to be 
It's in a it's in the basement area of my home. That's the that's the psyop labs to pull back the the veil of everybody thinking I'm actually a mad scientist. <laughs> I'm not I'm just fucking mad, okay? Like super fucking mad. And in the British version of the word mad, I'm mad. <laughs> we 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 will have our hobbies. Yeah. But um I bought like Again, we'll get onto that later. Yeah. <laughs> I, I bought this um broadband uh abs- absorbers for the corners and I put them all in the corners, did a quick clap test. Okay. And I bought all this stuff at once, but like the broadband absor- absorbers, I put those up first in the very far corners, did a clap test, and then I made basically like in your I I think it's called the tetrahedral corners or something. It's basically where three three walls meet three pieces meet like mm. your ceiling and then your two walls together that that trifecta corner that is your yeah. biggest echo causer and your biggest problem with sound bouncing everywhere so you focus on on, oh. on those at the top and the bottom you know where those three pieces meet and then you try to get the part where the two walls meet and that ends up cutting down the sound quite a bit and then the next bit you use you want to try and spread out your foam in such a way as to have it absorb basically on either side of the two walls where the directions that people are talking. Like if one person Mm. is talking one direction, you want to have it absorbed that way. And then if one person is talking the other direction, you have it absorbed that way. And that's when you're sitting across from each other at the desk, which Matt and I do, that's what I tried to do. But when I started doing that, I had most of the... Oh God, you have to look at him? (laughs) Not lately. The pandemic has had its bonuses. (laughs) Well... Yeah, well, there's, yeah. Yes. But um, when I started, I actually had foam on both both walls, you know, like one mm. behind him and then behind me. And then I started realizing, I'm like, wait a minute, my voice is not bouncing off of anything now. It's getting absorbed pretty well. But when Matt talks, mm. it goes through both mics. It bounces all the way around the room. Like, we're not joking. His voice is <laughs> so loud. Like it's fucking fog on. Yeah, like it's just unbelievably loud. How It's just, you would not believe how loud his voice actually is. But, oh no, I actually would believe it because your more recent shows where you've had to do it on Skype and you've had like an outtakey bit before you've crunched his voice and we've just got the pure Skype input. Yeah. <laughs> his voice sounded com- like the first time I was actually, oh, so that's what he actually sounds like. <laughs> like, because really, like your, your setup fucks with his voice like something <laughs> massive. Like, yeah, all the equipment. He, he's I've, still the same guy. Yeah, all the equipment that I bought has literally, like, I don't joke about that. It's literally to try and tame Matt's voice. There is no other way about that, you know? But so his voice was echoing so bad, I ended up basically putting all the foam behind my head. And then I ended up having, like, and, like, that did it for a while, but then he kept coming through my mic because his voice would boom so much that he would break through my gate on my mic that I put up, (laughs) you know? And for anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, there's a a noise gate is something that you use that would actually shut the mic down below a certain level of noise. It's a way to get rid of your your hiss and all of that kind of stuff that might come from the processing and all of that. Uh, They have digital noise gates that you can use after a fact, but... Those don't actually work, and they make the noise. They make their sound actually sound worse. We won't. We'll, we won't argue with digital versus analog because now I sound like a guy who collects records and thinks that LPs are like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> well, listen to his podcast and listen to one of mine because this motherfucker uses a real rack mounted noise gate, and I use a software noise gate after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Technically, I use both, but what I end up uh, well, okay, what I yes. end up <laughs> what I end up doing for the noise gate is I set it for anything below a certain level but then I try to have the noise get chopped off in the mics and then everything else when it's not being u- being used like below that actually my noise gate just kicked in cuz I looked away from the mic a little too much when I was talking <laughs> um, <laughs> So I put all the foam behind me and I put it off to the side in the directions that Matt normally talks. And that did a little bit for a while. And now I've gotten to the point where the microphone that he talks from, I took two pieces of sound foam and just basically secured them using um, Velcro straps that you would use to like tie up cords and, you know, cinch up cords and things like that. I made like this makeshift thing that hangs on the front of the mic that looks like an X-wing. That it hangs off the back of the mic, I should say. That looks like an X-wing, and what it basically does is, where his mouth is, it forms a sound mm. foam barrier, and you can always tell nice. when he shouts or tilts his head above that or below that in the episodes when he's in the studio <laughs> with me, because then it's Echo City again. <laughs> well, I've got one of those. One of those I bought with the hinges that you're supposed to put around the microphone, thinking that was awfully clever. Then I realized, no, I'm fucking claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way in the world i could stick my face in that thing and talk and of course you know if i was recording a three minute audio track and doing several takes that's one thing but when you're prattling into a microphone for one sometimes two hours 
I can't just be staring at a wall of foam. Like, my brain's not going to handle that. So it's kind of... I use it for voiceover stuff if I have to do it, but then otherwise it never gets touched. Well, I like... So. I would like to have one of those to basically just mount on the back of his mic or something along those lines. Basically what you're describing... Not to put so it, you can't see his face. Not, not so I can't see his face, but just so I can catch his voice. Basically, direct it at the lower half of him where his voice would boom out. So basically, mm. you would hang off the bottom half of the mic, and then he could peer his face out over top of it. You know, um, and I've seen uh, there's like a foam, like a sound foam ball that somebody made where you put a microphone inside of it, and it dulls all of the sound, and then has a built-in mm. pop filter that you talk into. Um, right. I think they're called the eyeball or something like that. And I hate to say this, but they are ridiculously overpriced, but I understand <laughs> because they've engineered them. They're quite, quite aesthetically pleasing. And they, mm. I've heard the sound test from them where they put the eyeball on or take it off. And this is for, um, it's primarily used for a lot of like, um, front, not front, uh, element, but like the, the side element talk that you would get for most of these, um, condenser type microphones like what you use and yeah. i'm more of a proponent because i'm trying like i've tried to build like a like a pirate radio station in my in my my office room that i that i have this set up in so i'm more like i want to use the actual stuff that a, a radio station would use so i have a lot of front end dynamic mics that you talk into i use the pr like a S sm58 sort of thing um the sm58 is actually uh there's the Shure microphone that that is one that I'm definitely I think it's the SM7B I think is what it's called. Um, the right. SM58 is basically like a handheld front end dynamic like that, mm. um, and that's like more for concerts or you'll see it in like tons of press conferences. They use them all the time in press conferences. That's usually that mic that'll be on the stage um, for the person. But to that's talk still to. that's a cardioid pickup, which isn't ideal for this, is it? So well, actually, cardioid is actually what you want. You want you want to basically have an envelope that is like just front cardoid um but the, it, the, but if you turn to the side on that it, it's not as like condensed as a better i know it's a similar pattern but i i, I don't know the nuances of it but okay. it's more tolerant if you look slightly away right. well the reason that they keep the dynamic mics that are like hyper or super cardoid is what we're kind of talking about versus regular cardoid and I don't know if who's going to be interested in this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we've gone way off the deep end. Yeah. With this. Well, it doesn't matter. We're talking stuff that we love, right? That's what people want to hear. <laughs> but um, a super, I mean, it is <laughs> <laughs> sort of, it's a super cardoid is very, very directional. It's directionality is what we're talking about. And it's pretty much, there's a narrow envelope that it will pick up the best audio. And the more you get away from the side of that element, the worse it's going to be. But mm -hmm. if you know how to work a dynamic mic, like folks that, do vocal work for say a band or a singer yeah. if you will which i've done uh, <laughs> if you know how to rock a dynamic mic you can use that to the best effect that you want you know you can actually make things sound differently by moving it around and now hmm. while a true condenser microphone that is like a really high quality very nice condenser microphone is more ideal for recording instruments and people and everything like that i mean even like like an artist say like Michael Jackson when he recorded I can't remember which album it was, but he used the Shure SM7B, which is like um, this big black honking microphone that has this very long um, pop filter built into it, and then the element is mm. behind that, and that microphone is like one of the radio broadcast standards, and you know that. Yeah. But the ones that a lot of radios use are the uh, EVRE20 which is like a $500 microphone, I think. And that <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's like the big ass microphone. Anybody that wants to see that, if you watch the movie Howard Stern's Private Parts, whenever he's actually on the air on the radio, he's usually talking into an RE20. Right. So there, there you go. But um, enough techie gear stuff that's probably going to bore the living shit out of people. We've done that for about 20-ish minutes, so we should probably move on to another <laughs> yeah, topic. Much. Like, you might have noticed, ladies and gentlemen, we've kind of missed each other. I've realized like we haven't, we haven't spoken in person other than like text chatting since the last show, I don't think. No, not really. Um, you got so super busy and then things oh. just fell apart. The world is dying on us. and We just haven't had an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty sure I didn't want to talk about the fucking crisis. Obviously, elements of that are coming into it. Obviously, like my rant at the beginning. But um, well, you can't avoid everybody's it. talking yeah, about it's that. It's a world changing event. You can't avoid talking mm. about it. But we can minimize it. Um, so, <laughs> right. I mean, we have to acknowledge it, but then let's move on. Yeah. Um, so w we spoke before. Basically, I had to go to Corfu, come back for a day, then go to Dubai. 
Um, and then after that, I came back and I had this work project I've been working on for quite a while, which is an entirely new, entirely new system launch. And uh, I mean, I shit, you know, I did, I think in one, one and a half months, I did 78 hours of overtime. Jesus. Um, it was, I've never worked so hard in my life. I mean, it damn near killed me. And after Christmas, when it settled down is actually when I sort of, I, I went off the deep end a little bit because I think my brain just didn't know what to do. Um, from, and obviously, you know, I'd had my recent sort of successes with fitness and so on and I'd lost a lot of weight and I was feeling great. And then I went on holiday for two whole weeks um, where, let's face it, I couldn't be strict with the diet. And, and why I mean, would you to honest, want it, to be? When I go on holiday, vacation <laughs> for the people in the States, I actually mm. love to just let myself go and I'll be like, okay, I'll pick it up where I left off when I come back and I'll undo all this damage. So why should you? It's a vacation slash holiday. But you, sir, would know, as well as anyone else, being on a ketogenic type style diet is, is the most unforgiving diet to fall off the wagon. Now, it, you can do it for a week or two. What you cannot do is do it over three, four months. No. The weight will come back hard yes. and with a vengeance. Yes. And this is something we know, um, but it, it sort of happened subtly. And then obviously, of course, as I got into the more stressful side of things, like I wasn't thinking about what I was eating. I was just eating. Like eating was an inconvenience and it needed to be fast and just done and out of the way. And I, I was conscious that I wasn't sticking to my way of doing things and i think the other thing is when you're keto you get used to eating quite high levels of fat and you sort of continue that for a little while and you think shit i shouldn't be doing that if i'm eating carbs as well you, you've got to like knock one on the head to do the other um so i was mixing for a little bit beforehand anyway long story short too late uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I put i put about 30 pounds of my 50 back on um over that period and yeah it was just it was absolutely brutal um, and it's only and, and even when this lockdown thing happened, we were all like, "Yeah, great, we're gonna get catch up with our podcasting. I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna make that." I've I've continued to be insanely busy because we decided to start offering free online classes of DDP yoga that I teach. Well, me and my wife teach, um, and that that got ridiculous. We're now teaching every day but Sunday, free classes, um, just because. I mean, that's just the way it's gone. We set the schedule. We decided to stick to it. And we're like week three or four now. Plus work. Plus, other, I'm like, plus trying to go out and go shopping and not get surrounded by dickheads at every point. And it's like, I, I have no time. <laughs> it's still absolutely bonkers. So, like, Court actually forced this point of like, dude, we need to fucking catch up. I'm like, we do. <laughs> and this is our vehicle to do it. So let's just get on the mic. Right. Like, we were like, well, we're going to. I was like, even if we don't fucking record it, let's just hop on Skype and fucking chat. And this is where, I mean, this, we're not really editing our conversations. This is how we talk, uh, well, how we yeah. talked off mic for OCD or any other time we record. It's just mm. stupid shit like this. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm actually proud to say that while my weight has been fluctuating up and down, the initial 100 plus pounds that I've lost has stayed off. It's the, oh, well it's the vanity pounds, which are really the hardest ones to shed. When it's all about, oh. like, feeling better about how you look as opposed to, I don't want to die of a heart attack when I'm 40. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So those last, those that, that last 20 pounds is a motherfucker. I mean, like, and I know so many people who are trying to kill them right now. I mean, if anybody's sort of looked at the internet in the last year, you probably come across Vance Hines at some point. This is the guy who lost 198 pounds in a year. Um, uh, initially through just walking and then he found ddp yoga and he started doing that um and he sort of hit that plateau point and i watched him for so long because he or, like he's faultlessly every monday he gets on his scales that talk to him because he couldn't see them initially because the guy was 475 pounds or something um and he keeps weighing in every week and we've seen the weight go up we've seen it come down and he's back on a downward trend now couldn't be happier for him but he is fucking fought to get through that point and it's that your body it's your brain has this like thermostat which is like no you should be this weight and you're like no i want to be less than that well yeah but you should be this weight and the pendulum will always swing back to that point you've got to you've got to work so hard to push it beyond it well um, the reason and we talked about this off mike for me the reason that i've been holding off on doing the actual exercise component and just trying to lose as much as I can is whenever I hit that plateau for the diet component, which is 
some would argue more important than the exercise component for losing weight. Mm, um, it is. I wanted to be able to have that. Oh yeah, body. We'll wait till this comes at you for me to start <laughs> for me to start exercising and everything. Um, and I tend to do a very I don't want to call it lazy, but it pretty much is a lazy man's type of workout where I do a one day a week, do every muscle group, do multiple compound types of exercise that is ridiculous and basically go to point of failure, all eccentric training, which with uh, folks that don't may not know, eccentric training is focusing on lowering the weight where you have more time under tension, which actually develops muscle more. It's a scientific thing that you can kind of yep. look up. And to do proper eccentric training, you have to really be careful. But essentially what I end up doing is I use two arms to raise like a dumbbell and then one arm mm. to lower it. So it's something that I have to hold on to with two arms to raise it and then force myself to lower it as slowly as I can with one arm. Okay. That kind of workout. And then when I'm doing mm. like uh, any kind of a pull-up or something like that, which, given my weight, I have to assist myself with either using, like, a chair or something like that to go up and then lower myself down, that kind of thing, or squats or anything like that, I... Oh, I have the biggest resistance band money can buy. Right. The highest weight load. <laughs> and then I can do a chin-up. <laughs> right. So, I, I, I work on, I, like, that's how I used to, to work out. And when I did that, I mean, to use the, the parlance, I was swole. And part of the reason why I ended up getting as overweight as what I did was I could literally, when I was working out like that when I was younger, I could literally eat anything I wanted. And then when mm. you stop working out and you still eat anything that you wanted, and then your metabolism lowers and lowers and lowers, the next thing you know... And you get older. Right. Yeah. And you get older because your metabolism <laughs> lowers. You, The next thing you know, you're ridiculously overweight. And I didn't really... I didn't really kind of come right out and say it but i was topping the charts at close to 400 when i started this right and i got down to um i mean when i say close to 400 i've lost about 120 pounds i'm sitting at about 240 ish like to 250 depending because like i said my weight's been fluctuating and the final amount of weight that i need to lose in my book is about 40 to 50 pounds i need to be right at 200 you know or a yeah little, me too or below it now i'm way shorter than you like i'm barely five foot seven I'm like maybe five foot eight if I put on. I was only two inches, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, for my height, the the mm -hmm. the obesity chart and everything like that, um, two hundred pounds is still overweight. But yeah, also fuck him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. But but also I'm not like your typical person that is that height. I'm almost as wide as I am tall at the shoulders. Like I'm <laughs> right. I'm like almost. You're a tank. Yeah, I'm like two and a half to three feet wide at the shoulders without muscle, just the frame of the bone. We measured me. I'm. Mm -hmm two and a half feet to almost three feet <laughs> wide at the shoulders. Like I am built like a railroad spike, <laughs> you know, get my hammer. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just the way that I'm, I'm built. It's just what I have to work with. I come from very stocky, very broad shouldered people. I mean, when you look at me, it, you probably wouldn't believe that my descent is mostly Norse and, or, uh, you know, that Scandinavian country, people because i don't look anything like it <laughs> mm. <laughs> but like i'm I'm built like a squat dwarf that's just ready to fucking lift a tree at you <laughs> <laughs> well then lifting is like the ideal thing isn't right it? that's and i i actually don't get, yeah. i don't mind doing it and the way that i do the workout is one day a week and then you work out so hard that it takes you a full week to recover and then i try to do some walking and various other tasks like that um and i've been way more active that's one of the better sides of keto is you get this weird upbeat of energy where like all of a sudden you feel oh, like you yeah. need to do stuff because mm -hmm. your brain's like well dude you have all this energy do something with all this fat just do something <laughs> you know <laughs> how many times have you sat there watching a film about 11 o'clock at night and you're just saying to your legs will you fucking sit still you're not going anywhere it's like having a dog that wants to go and do three laps of the garden and it's 11 o'clock at night and you're like no <laughs> I get restless legs so often. It's ridiculous. Well, I, I don't necessarily get restless legs, but I, um, I, I pretty much believe that I have undiagnosed ADD. Like uh, from all the stuff that they say about how ADD works, because I've always done it. I just think that I was in mm -hmm. the right age group and in the small enough school where nobody noticed that I had it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, me too. It just didn't, it just <laughs> didn't happen. And I was, I was like high functioning with it or something where I was able to like use it to where I could just get by. You know, mm. but um, I, I like right now I'm tapping my feet. I'm tapping my fingers on my desk a little bit. I'm moving my hands around a lot. And even when I'm. Do you fiddle with shit on your desk? Do you like try and like put things to, like I've got clips from like film sets 
and I like they're noisy, so I don't tend to do it on mic. But I sit there and I like try and line the teeth up. Uh, it's just that weird fiddling thing. Okay, right now I have all of my Godzilla figures set out in front of me, and just as you were asking me if I fiddle with things on my desk, I was moving one to pose them a little bit better. Oh my god, we were separating a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Um, yeah. <laughs> like all the front edge of my desk, like this desk I've got, it's a corner shaped desk, and it has the back end cut off. And when we moved into this flat, the room I'm in has a corner that isn't a corner. So that they've cut it at 45 degrees across the corner. And this desk fits perfectly into like, I mean, imagine my OCD on that. It was like, oh my God, that's amazing. But <laughs> It's like so my I desk makes buy. sense finally. <laughs> yes, it never made sense in any other place. And I can't throw it away because of that. And it's got a little under tray and it kept falling over because the floor wasn't even. So I've like welded a piece of wood across the bottom to make because I cannot throw this desk away. All across the front edge here. The veneer's gone and there's holes in it because I've sat here with like spikes or headphone jack adapters and I've pushed them into the chipboard and made patterns and just <laughs> while I'm podcasting or talking or something, it's just like, or I'm on the phone and I'm just stabbing holes in shit. It's like, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay. Okay. This is, this is fucking creepy, right? I had a very similar desk. Only it was the, the the right angle that I would like. I had it into the corner of my office. This is before mm. I built the studio and bought new stuff. But this desk was falling apart because I used to work from home um, ages and ages ago with that same desk. And I was taking phone calls for, you know, those uh, 1-800 call now if you want to order, say, a my pillow or, well, don't order a my pillow because fuck that guy. Um, <laughs> but like, um, you know, one of them was like a, a lingerie called the Trashy Girls. One of them was like a, it, nice, like <laughs> kids videos for like uh, baby animals or something like that that a grandma would order, and they would target these ads. And then when you would call the number with your credit card to order, I was at the mm. other line, so I want everybody to think about that and be scared. <laughs> but it was a twenty-four hour yeah. thing, so we had to have twenty-four hour coverage because we would have different clients mm. that would take calls all over the world for like different times. And I was working mm. in my house processing these orders or whatever whenever someone call in. But here's the thing: I would work forty-hour weeks doing this late at night, and I would get one to two calls a week. So I would literally, oh, really? yeah, I'd be literally sitting there watching movies, doing nothing else, just waiting <laughs> to see if a call would come in with the headphones on my head. Mm. And it got to the point where I would literally just go to sleep and have the headphones up loud enough that if somebody woke me up, <laughs> yes. you know, calling in, then I would just answer the call, do the do the spiel that I was supposed to do and go. And mm. obviously this program failed. They they didn't get enough calls in. The clients weren't happy, but it wasn't our fault that nobody was calling. We we took the calls when we could. Yeah. And most people waited to call into the daytime, regardless of when they saw it, they would write down the number or whatever and then call later. But they had to mm. have the coverage for 24 hours. So I was working and getting paid to basically watch movies and or sleep. It was the best job I ever had, dude. <laughs> but anyway, amazing. I wanted to just kind of show everybody the boredom that I had. So I had this desk that I, I, I collect switchblades. I collect butterfly knives. I collect fixed blade knives. I collect knives. I like things that can hurt and or, you know, tools to cut things. Um, so oh I'd be, God, we were separated at birth. Yeah, so, I, <laughs> so I'd be playing, I'd be playing. Can you flick a butterfly knife properly? Yeah, um, actually, um, do, you, do you know the way that, uh, it's kind of the ghetto way to open it? I don't know if that's racist there or not, but where you hold on to the little thing that holds the butterfly knife together, the little hinge part that goes over, you can hold on to that and drop it to open it and use the centripetal force of the blade dropping to open it and then catch it and have it in a stabbing motion. Have you ever seen anybody do that? No, but I imagine that's very fast, uh, and hence the ghetto version. Right, it's basically like stabby, stabby, stab time, and I practice that really hardcore to be able to do it. If I can find one of my butterfly <laughs> knives, my wife has forbade me from playing with butterfly knives because they drive her nuts. That <laughs> I, I actually don't own one anymore, but in the other room, I have a butterfly bottle opener. Nice. And I flick it like a butterfly knife. Right. Open shut, open shut, open shut. Now, to keep the practice. Is it bay long is the correct term from that? And butterfly is the anglicized term, I think. Uh, it's ba balasong. Balasong. Okay. I just didn't know the pronunciation. Mm. But anyway, I know it as butterfly knives. And they were the only thing that was legal in the state of Pennsylvania that you could have for one hand opening knives when I was a kid. So that's how I started collecting mm. those. Switchblades were illegal there. So you fast forward to, to, to now, and I'm living in Nebraska, where literally everything is legal as long as, you know, it's a weapon. 
<laughs> pretty much like you want an anti tank so nothing's legal here i don't think butterfly knives are even legal here like nothing you can't have anything right I used to have a friend who collected knives and he used to go to Spain on holiday with his parents, go to those really wicked cool knife shops and then hide them in the lining of his suitcase. But as long as he put them in the hold, no one checked those suitcases. So he would bring knives, swords. He had uh, morning star, uh, um, throwing stars, throwing knives. He had the lot. And I, was, I couldn't get anything, but uh, my obsession slightly came from his collection. <laughs> right. Okay, so I have all these butterfly knives and then switchblades later on and stuff like that. And I'm playing with them at night because I'm bored or I'm flipping the switchblade. And I still do that when I'm recording sometimes. You'll hear the switchblade come through. Uh, that's happened on OCD, <laughs> you know, because I, I fidget with stuff. Well, when you have a knife and you're playing with a knife and you got a piece of wood in front of you, what are you going to do with that? You're going to fucking stab it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it just perforate the fuck. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm bored. I have this chipboard fucking desk that's a piece of shit that does a little corner desk that I that I need to keep. I'm stabbing the fuck out of this desk and I start destroying it. And then I realize, oh shit, I have to keep using this desk and it's getting really, really fucked up. I need to do something to fix it. So then I spend the next couple of nights um, after I've been stabbing the desk long enough to where it becomes almost unusable, you know, where the front's peeling off and all the stuff that you're describing. I then start repairing it by putting duct tape over everything. <laughs> Metal. Right. And so I have this entire literally duct tape desk because I put it over everything, like except for the hinges and the parts of the drawers that need to slide out. But like all the wood surfaces are now covered in duct tape. And then I'm like, well, since I've got a duct tape up already, I, I could use a nice drawer pull right here. Why don't I just make a drawer pull out of duct tape that I can pull on to open the drawer? And I do. I'm like, hey, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, well, you know, I could kind of use a little bit of a a wrist pad for, you know, the little part of the desk that pulls out that your keyboard's on, you know, the, to yeah. set my wrists on. I'm like, I could make that out of duct tape. And I do, you know, I start, you know, like I, I grab like a bunch of like shitty plastic bags or something like that and roll them up to where they're, you know, more cushiony and I make duct tape around that. And then I duct tape it to the desk. And then I'm like, you know what I could really use is a drink holder on this desk. So I make that out of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I'm like, oh, and then I'm like, well, you know, I could really like use some other things. Like I just start coming up with all these ideas of like what I, what I can have to hold things and, and all that. And I'm like, well, I need something to hold this, uh, these headphones so i like you know make a little wire clip and then roll that in duct tape and then you know make it to where it's more sturdy and then i have this clip and all this stuff so i just basically have this giant duct tape computer desk by the time that i'm done you, you fast forward to when i have to move to my house house and my wife's like that's not coming with us <laughs> Franken desk, right? And I'm like, no, you're you're absolutely right, honey. The desk does not need to come with us. You know, I'm like, wink, wink, Love nudge, it. nudge. No, yeah, I got you, I got you. And then like, we start moving everything else, and I'm leaving the desk of the apartment that we're we're leaving to go and move to the house. And then I get to the point where I'm like, and I'm sitting there with my friend, and we're like trying to figure out where to cut the duct tape to be able to dismantle the desk to move it. And my wife's like, no, that is not coming into our house. <laughs> and I'm like, but look at all the work I put into this. And she's like. <laughs> Look at how shitty that fucking looks. Like, she said those words to me. She doesn't swear much. I'm like, yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> so what does my friend and I do? Uh, we take my halberd, which is a spear axe kind of deal. It's, a, it's an axe with a spearhead on it. And we decide, well, let's see how good this Renaissance Fair halberd that I bought is. And let's see how much this desk can hand up, hold, hold up to it with all the duct tape on it. Well, absolutely. What else would you do? I mean, for me, it'd be a broadsword, but fair enough. That's well. We also this is what you do. <laughs> I also have a flail, which is uh, I, some people call it a morning star. Oh, yeah. I prefer a flail. Morning stars, I believe, are the spiky ball on the end of just a staff or like a like yeah. A, f a flail is a cylinder with spikes in my book. Oh, what I know as a flail is the ball on a chain that comes off the end of a, like a, a handheld uh, pole of some sort, whether it's two hands or one hand. No. What do you call that? I mean, I, yeah, that's still a morning that's star. A morning star. star is because it's round. Uh, a flail is a cylinder with spikes on a chain. Um, anything attached directly to the stick is a mace. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. All right, so this was mm. this was a flail with a chain. I have two of those. Okay. I have one. Nice. I have one that is um, pewter at the end. Oh, I want to come to your house and play. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you want to, you are definitely invited. I'll make room for you to hang out. Um, but um, so I have like one that has uh, it's like a pewter cast um, and it's supposed to be decorative. And I didn't know this at the time. But um, so we use that flail. And then I bought another one later, which is like uh, hard cast aluminum ends. Um, right. And it's two chains and two balls at the end of that flail. Whoa. <laughs> or 
Nice. Or Morningstar, whatever you want to call it. So we're going at this desk with this <laughs> thing, you know, and just kind of like destroying it, you know, get, going left and right. Um, the one that's made out of Purter was way too soft, and the desk kind mm. of won out. Um, one of, right, one of, yeah, it would. One of, the, one of the spikes got a little flattened from it because the duct tape was holding everything together. Um, I'm sad to say that the, <laughs> the, um, the Halberd-Axe-Spear uh, combo didn't hold up too well uh to the desk it made it it did the most damage because i kept it sharp but unfortunately um the the wood that they used to make it was not that sturdy and that's what broke Mm. the actual axe blade was still fine and i was trying to find somebody that would make me a more sturdy handle um for it you know like something that was really like usable but then you need a hardwood for that right (laughs) um and or just like I was trying to get it like cast aluminum, you know, so like where they could cast it yeah. all together, mm-hmm. like basically just cast the aluminum around this thing. Um, but nice. Basically, I was trying to make the axe from Mandy, I guess. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, the axe did the most work and destroyed the desk the most. But the the champion is the two ball flail that's cast aluminum. That thing <laughs> just wrecked that desk, and we had so much fun destroying that boss. That was amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> You've got no idea how well this ties into something else I wanted to talk about. Um, so, lo- lockdown being what it is, I actually I started a new sport um, just before lockdown. I did one lesson, and I'm kind of gutted that's the way it went, but I found my way with it at home. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint here. <laughs> lightsaber battling? You're you're learning how to lightsaber battle? I bought a lightsaber. Yeah. Um so basically a while back, probably before Christmas, uh I heard that the French was it the French Sports Council or someone like that basically had recognized lightsaber dueling as a legitimate sport, which basically means eligible for Olympic inclusion. Now, a few years ago at I can't remember which Olympics it was. Was it Atlanta? It might have been London. I can't even remember. They had like a a demonstration between the fencing bouts. Now, fencing, I've been doing since I was 13 years old. Um, for context, I used to be nationally ranked. I went to a state school that had a fencing club, which was incredibly unusual. So I used to fence with all the posh kids from the private schools. Oh, yeah. Ho, 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 ho. Um, <laughs> so they... And I turned up with my long hair and fucking metal jacket, and then I took it all off and put fencing gear on and pranced around like the rest of them. And... I did okay, um, but it sort of all went away. And f- I love fencing. Don't get me wrong. I love the sport. I love the discipline. I've loved it for years. I go back to it on a regular basis. May I fence once a year nowadays because I don't like any of the local clubs because they're fucking snobs around London, as far as I can tell. Uh, I think that's just and fencing it, in general. It, I, well, my old club up in the Midlands, you know, in the middle of England, was one of the most humble, um, just really high standard of fencing because rule one for me if i walk into a fencing club and beat everybody i'll never go back fair enough why would you you got nothing to learn exactly so uh, it's not a arrogance thing it's just at my level i need to walk in and have my ass kicked if i get my ass kicked i'll go back unless i get my ass kicked by a bunch of entitled fucking wankers which is what happened in this area anyway enough about that (laughs) (laughs) i believe i I believe you've aired it properly yeah um so when i i moved south i had a bit more disposable income i bought a new mask i bought a new jacket i bought a new kit so i could compete and then this club i was going to i said look let me compete for you uh, i came fifth in their club championship after being out of the loop for like two years i came fifth i'm like well surely that's good enough for me to make your local teams or whatever but because i wouldn't pay your monthly subs they wouldn't let me fence for them i don't know why it was it, it, it was really odd um and it pissed me off, basically. It's like, you know, screw you guys. And I, the only other club re, uh, nearby is about 25-minute drive away, and it's Friday nights. And it just didn't work. I went once. It was okay. They seemed like a nicer bunch. I was considering it, but Friday night just is the worst night of the week. I'm just always knackered and pissed off, and I've just had enough by that point. Not the night to be going out and exercising. So, this <laughs> found out that this was being recognized as a sport. Um, And at this Olympics thing, they did this demo. They turned all the lights off and two people came in and did a choreographed lightsaber duel. So no masks, lots of 
flow and go spinny backwards over their head impressive looking shit um and i thought yeah it's already made its debut at the olympics effectively so it's it's a shoe in within the next not obviously not tokyo because that's gonna be pushed back a year now but i reckon by the next one it'll be up for consideration at least there are organizations popping up all over the place the tsl in the states is huge they already have big tournaments all the time now every little organization has its own rules its own approaches the tsl is kind of full contact everyone wears lacrosse gloves uh full body armor gorgets around the throat uh historical european martial arts fencing masks which are built to a higher weight rating than a standard fencing mask like for so uh, take harder like hits. for stick fighting and stuff those types of masks no like for long sword fighting oh, masks gotcha <laughs> yeah. okay yeah the dull edge yeah, but it. still will fuck you up if you get hit with it type sword fighting yeah you see now i did flirt with hema as well but even that was a little bit too because for hema you've got to be into the history of it and the development and the copying of a style written in a book a hundred years ago um it it's it's still not me and when I found out the lightsaber dueling, I was like, oh my God, this is it for me. Because the way I got into fencing was when I was about 12 years old, my friend found a, he was into D&D and he found an article in one of his D&D magazines that talked about live role playing. LARP. And before we knew it, we, LARP, we were in his back garden. We knew nothing about anything, but we took an old roll up sleeping mat and a bamboo cane and a roll of tape and we taped the foam around the stick and we were, Fast forward three, six months, we were bashing the shit out of each other in his back garden with halberds, maces, morning stars, all made out of foam and insulating tape. I spent all my money on broom handles, insulating tape, <laughs> and pipe lagging. And, and those were our early weapons. Um, I learned single-handed, I learned double-handed, I learned spear, I learned morning star, just from watching movies, nothing else. And hitting my friends <laughs> finding out what worked and what didn't and then when i went to my senior school and found out that they had a fencing club i was like oh, okay i can i can do this legitimately and obviously i took to it like a duck to water because i'd spent years practicing already so it's it's kind of swords have always been my thing um, well that explains your rapier wit <laughs> i love it thank you see we did that. um <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and also, I was born a Star Wars fan. I don't remember an age where I wasn't fucking crazy about Star Wars. All we talked about, all the toys we had, everything we did at school from age five upwards was Star Wars, as far as I can recall. It, it's just been ever-present in my life, and I've always loved the idea of lightsabers. So imagine my joy to find out that they build polycarbonate blades where you can hit someone as hard as you like, and it will not break. The balance is really good, and you can do this thing. So... Then I, I thought, okay, I, I joined the TSL uh, UK group and the, there's fuck all here. Like, it, it hasn't really taken off here. There's people meeting uh, in Peterborough once or twice a year. I think there's one tournament or one get together, but it's embryonic in this country. Um, and then I found out that a guy who runs a local fencing club, which unfortunately I, I went to once and like I say, the standard wasn't enough to keep me going back. No offense to him. It was just the people who go into his club. Um, he's a really nice guy, but I call that's not the club for me. Um, when the last Star Wars film came out, we went to the midnight showing because I'm a big fucking Star Wars nerd. We walk into the foyer of my local Odeon cinema and there's two guys with fencing masks on beating the shit out of each other with lightsabers. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> And I just made a beeline for the roped off area. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, we're doing a workshop on Saturday. Here's the sign up sheet. I'm like, where do I sign? Where do I sign? Where do I sign? Living here is like, oh God. <laughs> Seven year old Buzz has come back out. I was so excited. And then I realized it's the same guy who was coaching at this fencing club. He's done a course in what they call LED Saber. And he's now bringing it to this area. Now he's had a bit of trouble getting interest which surprises the hell out of me but then i've realized this area is so stuck up people don't do childish things um so eventually i went along to a class there was only like two or three of us there um but he put a lightsaber in my hand he showed me the basics and then the other guy fucked off and for the last 20 minutes i fenced one-on-one -on -one with the coach and i was like yeah sign me up <laughs> I fucking love this. All right, so are um, you telling me that you have the potential to be a lightsaber Olympic athlete for your country? 
I very much doubt it because I'm too old and slow. But because <laughs> this will take off, and the young, quick, amazing fencers will come up and through. But okay, I do have... so you could be an <clears throat> Olympic grade coach of lightsaber battling for your country at some point, right? Well, the, the thing is, I've got over 20 years experience of hitting people with sticks, swords, anything vaguely sword shaped. I want to hit people with it. That's always what I've done. Right. And um, two handed for me is it's like me going back to what I always wanted to do. Um, and a, me wielding a broadsword like Hema is not an option because my shoulders are fucked. Um, there's still a problem. But a lightsaber blade is so light and the weight is all in the pommel. They're beautifully balanced. And, I, and you're not supposed to hit hard. You have to pull your hit slightly. So the load on my shoulders is significantly reduced. And then I find out, looking at their videos and their training materials for this organization, they go to Comic-Con and they do demos dressed up. So they do like... They do competitive tournaments trying to get hits against the other person. A hit only counts if the blade has travelled through 90 degrees. Uh, like, arc. Because the thing that pissed me off about sabre fencing, is that, which is the cutty weapon in traditional fencing, is it's degenerated to the point where the person who moved first has priority. So if, they then, if you then hit together, the person whose foot moves first is their point. Fucking hate that. Um... The other thing is, is the slightest brush of one of your hairs, if it makes an electrical connection, that stupid fucking box is going to go beep and the light's going to come on. Like, my rule of thumb with Sabre, old school Sabre used to be two judges behind each fencer. And they only put their hand up to say they'd heard a hit. If the other fencer went, ow, motherfucker, or you heard a thwack, (laughs) if there was the slightest glimpsing blow of an arm, you didn't get the point. So... The electronics have ruined that sport for me because I will do a really nice overhead parry as someone tries to hit me on the top of the head. The blade will hit my blade. Because it's flexible, it will bend over my blade and very lightly graze the top of my mask, sending a signal to the box, the light comes on, Mal parry his attack. My God, that's fucking annoying. Take the mask off. If you can draw blood, you get the fucking point. If I make you bleed first... I win. Trust me, I would win 50, 60% more fights than I currently do. So, All right, how does that translate fact- <laughs> to, the, to the lightsaber battle? You said it's a 90 degree hit, so you have to basically swing and hit with that swing, right? Yeah, basically. So there has to be momentum to the swing that lands. If you just put your blade in line with somebody's shoulder, for say, and they run onto it and it grazes across the top of their shoulder, you don't get a point because you didn't hit them. Yeah, it's got to be a hit. And not every, like the Sabre Legion in the US, they allow thrusts, like pointy stabby. (laughs) That's a banned move in this one. And I like that. I don't want to be poked with a lightsaber. Well, that would pretty much make it to where all the Sith Lords would win, because isn't that how all the Sith Lords get taken down in Star Wars? (laughs) It's pointy stabby. (laughs) Yeah, basically. But it's too easy to, like, if if you make that a rule, then everyone's going to go one-handed, everybody's going to start just fucking fencing and they're just going to stab you to win. And then you've got the same sport over again. So the reason I love the LED Sabre setup, for one of the reasons I love the LED Sabre setup, is it has to be a cut. It cannot be a stab. That means they don't have to be as strict on armor, gorgets. You need the gorget around your neck in case someone stabs you in the throat and kills you. Because these things are hard plastic. It, you know, they hurt. Um, so if it's a cutting motion only then you're protected. And if you've got a fencing mask, it's got the bib. It, you know, if thrusts are outlawed, that should be enough protection. Um, the other thing is, the guys who've set this up in the UK, they come from a kung fu background. <laughs> it's, it's, um, is it Qigong kung fu? So they have put kung fu footwork with kung fu sword techniques in with lightsabers. You learn slow meditative blade movements, accurate parries accurate like and it's been designed in a martial sense now when my fencing fell apart i went hard into martial arts because i needed something like that in my life it didn't really work out for me for service but i I, I did taekwondo for years i've done wing chun i've done kendo i've done kali a screamer which is because i wanted to learn how to use a sword in both hands i can do that as well by the way um (laughs) see a scream is the type of martial arts that i was super into i like the idea of hitting someone with a big fucking club 
yeah i mean it's great fun but uh, <laughs> the thing with that is you've got to have really good gloves and if you catch a rap on the knuckles um the reason i stopped is i got a couple of really nasty hits on the hand just in drills with heavy bamboo sticks and my hands were my life at that point like if you break one of my fingers i cannot work for three weeks yeah um, i kind of need my hands for work and also to masturbate so that's not good <laughs> yeah. i mean there's workarounds for the other but the yeah. right like a um, go heated up melon in the oven or something i don't know yeah something like that yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just off the top of my head the first thing i thought of i would try Ah, it's better than just going straight on the apple pie route, isn't it? So, um, <laughs> well, somebody's got to eat that. At least the melon you could throw away and pretend like it went bad. Yeah, true. Good point. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> right, if it's already a confectionery, don't fuck it. Just eat it. Yeah, I, I, it's a terrible waste. Otherwise, I mean, fruit, veg, it's a, it's it's an easy dispose, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, the. I, I I stopped the Carly basically because of that and then I moved away and then when I moved here there were no Carly clubs I love Carly I still do Carly drills in my living room to keep myself I can still do the spinny stick stuff and everything else um, so <laughs> imagine my love when I found this sport and then I found this organisation they're going to bring a martial edge to it they're very martial disciplined about weight transference and movement and yin and yang and all of that is involved so I get that element of my passion mixed with the lightsaber stuff mixed with let's fucking go to comic con dress up like badasses and just fucking belt the shit out of each other to get people to join our sport I mean like please sign me up in the most severe way possible for every element of this so since lockdown <laughs> My clothes rack behind me that I hang my soundproofing of that we've already mentioned um, now has Dave hanging in the middle of it. <laughs> and um, D- Dave is basically a roller blind tube uh, with a one of my old sofa cushions gaffer taped to it in a torso shape with another tube going down to the bottom crossbar taped to that. Um, and then another sp- the, the top of that spike coming out and then a foam head wrap and a head shape planted on top of that also gaffer tape to that so i have a head torso training buddy called dave who i beat the shit out of with my lightsaber um so that looks slightly creepy (laughs) (laughs) and then we're back to the masturbation alternatives if you break a finger too with dave (laughs) well going right back you see like when i started here goes nothing which is my first ever podcast like 12 years ago whatever i did it with my mate dave and dave is the guy who got me into carly and we used to do Carly competitions together. And he actually came second or whatever in this competition. So we call him Dangerous Dave the Carly Killer. Um, oh, now so that's named... a title that needs to be used in a fucking low-budget B-movie about violence and bloodshed. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous Dave the Carly Killer. I can already create a legend around that guy. <laughs> you see, Dangerous Dave never uses guns. What's he use? Sticks. Sticks. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, but he's a Carly Killer. What's Carly? You ever heard of a screamer? No. You know what Filipino stick fighting is? Kind of? All right. Have you heard of Arnis? <laughs> Listen, man, you don't want to fuck with Dave, especially if he busts out the lead pipe versions. <laughs> uh, but Dave, Dave was like pure class. He was from Newcastle under Lyme, which I, I don't know if you, you're familiar with the accent. Um, I'm terrible at doing it. But he's like, why, hey, man, up in the North Lake. They talk like that. Um, and he was hilarious. We came out of this competition and we did this little video saying, like, Dave won. And he just he had this trophy and he just pinged it with his finger and he went, ding. <laughs> trophy's a bit. And he just goes, he just goes, trophy's a bit shite. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that point, my friend Casey gave him the moniker of Dangerous Dave the Carly Killer. Trophy's a bit shite was the tagline. Um, but then Casey ended up being my co host for years after when Dave left. So there was this lovely cyclical poetic thing to it anyway oh, shouldn't give me alcohol so, um, <laughs> so i built dave the other thing is recently i don't know if you've seen uh fencing masks i've started painting them because fencing so fucking boring to watch that they started to do all kinds of things years back they put windows in them so you could see through the mesh so you could see the person's face and we all hated that because we kind of like the anonymity of a mesh in front of our face then they put lights in the head so you could see when they scored a point and it all went wireless. And then recently they've been spraying the country's flag on the mesh because when you're looking through it, you can't see it's painted. Everyone else can see where you're from. So Leon Paul, who was like the biggest supplier of fencing gear worldwide, now spray 
a mask and you pay extra. So my friend Pablo years ago, um, when I first bought this mask, I was like, oh, I can spray it. I want a cool design. I sent him a picture of my mask. He drew on the picture on his phone and sent it back to me. Now, this is the guy who like um, is, is just a phenomenal artist. Just something he did in his lunchtime. Sent it back. This fucking cool skull design. I was like, that's amazing. And then I sat on it for ages. Um, and then I saw the painting was coming out more. And I looked at the rules and regulations. Can I paint a terrifying fucking skull on my fencing mask? And basically it was like, yes, and you can train in a club. But if you go to a competition, they may tell you to take it off and you can't wear that. Uh, now this has come along. I'm like, I'm not fencing competitively again. If I do anything competitively again, it's with a fucking lightsaber. I'm going Sith. That fucking skull is going on my mask. <laughs> so this week, I sat there for five hours and I gaffer taped and I masked out the shape of this skull from this angled picture that Pabs had done for me and I made it three-dimensional and I managed to do it and I sprayed it up. My God, it looks amazing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I then sort of like, okay, what what sort of Sith thing do I align myself with? So I went into like the Old Republic, the legends in Star Wars, looked at different Sith characters, and I, I've just gone down the rabbit hole. Okay, no, are you sticking no with catching the new now. canon though, or are you going to the, uh, the sideline canon for your Sith? I'm going sideline, because there isn't enough Sith otherwise. Right. And I, I found a character called Darth Revan. I don't know if you've heard of him. No, I only know enough because of Matt. I mean, I was big into Star Wars when I was a kid, but once I found horror movies, sci-fi went the wayside, and right. Star Wars was, like, really, really pushed to the side for me. I know enough about it to hold a conversation, and that's about it. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, in sort of... Um, Star Wars lore, because Knights of the Old Republic was a really popular computer game, and then the novel source spawned off the back of that, and it, like how which came first, I don't really know. But looking back into it, this guy has the most interesting storyline of any character in the entirety of Star Wars that I've seen, and he's never been in any of the cartoons or any of the films. Now, if Disney now don't think that they should delve back into what's already been written what the fans already love and bring one of those characters to life like him like malik that there's some really good stuff there um and he he basically like the mandalorians were a warring race and he took them out and he he basically killed the chief mandalorian like one-on-one -on -one combat that's how badass this guy maybe is. maybe they will bring um, him back with the mandalorian series i would do you know what i would Having read up, like I've now ordered, like because I've got an Audible subscription that was going to waste. I've I got one of the Star Wars novels. I'm listening to that because I want to know more about this guy. And it's all as sad as my fencing mask needed a logo on the side, so I started to look at the little insignias in Star Wars, <laughs> and then <laughs> That's the coolest looking one. That's all it takes. <laughs> yeah, the, the coolest looking one was for Darth Revan. So I'm like, oh, who's this guy? Before I know it, I'm way down the rabbit hole with this guy, and it's painted on the side of my mask now. <laughs> I'm I'm not the mask isn't him. I'm not going to try and be him, but it's more like like this kind of Sith character I'm creating with my costume is going to be a lion. You could be like his apprentice, right? Yeah. There you go. And the thing is my two favorite lightsaber colors are purple and red, and he uses both at the same time. <laughs> like it's a sign. <laughs> That's pretty fucking sweet, actually. That That's cool. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not a Yeah. This is probably one of the main things that we differ on except for maybe some tastes in movies. Um, but mm. like Star Wars is not something that I'm as big into, but I understand the fandom for it. Like I get why people would love it like they do. You know, it's, mm. it's, and I don't mean this to be divisive because Matt's not in the room and I like to be divisive about Star Wars with Matt because I like how worked <laughs> up he gets, but it's essentially a space soap opera. That's what the tale is. You know, there's, yeah. it has to do with the families. It goes for a long time. There's yes, a lot of action, a lot of other things like that, but it is a space soap opera. Again, not meaning that to be divisive in this context. And I just, it, that doesn't really grab me. Now, it's pretty much the only time I side with Matt against you is when you're giving him shit for like his Star Wars. I'm like, shut up, motherfucker. <laughs> right. But I want it known. Like, you know, well, I'll do it on this show because Matt will never fucking listen to this. It's literally only to get a, a rise out of Matt. Like, I don't even, I, I don't even feel as strongly against Star Wars as I pretend to with Matt. 
because I like to just piss Matt off. Like, because he will literally, like, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is say the words, fuck Star Wars, and he will fucking freak. Like, whether I mean it or not. You know, like, I can say it to you and you're going to laugh. Like, fuck Star Wars, and you don't care. You know? No, it's Star Wars. It's it's frivolous sci-fi. It's like, like... Right, but no, like, to him, like, Star Wars is fucking life, dude. <laughs> is it, like, on the census, does he put his religion down as Jedi? I don't know, but I wouldn't doubt that he would try, honestly. Although he's very right, The Catholic. next time we get one, I'm putting fucking Sith. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I know he's, like, super, super obsessed with it. And not, like, and almost in an unhealthy way. <laughs> <laughs> you know well he ask him if he knows who death darth revan is then that'd be interesting i wouldn't be surprised if he does i really would not <laughs> um there was a we did a thing where and i did this because i thought i was going to embarrass him and make him look like a chump right he went head to head with a guy named chris on outside the cinema who right. probably is the end all be all of star wars knowledge and trivia like he Chris knows so much fucking shit about Star Wars, like, and, and sub-characters and all of this other stuff. And uh, right. Bill from Outside the Cinema has this Star Wars trivia game, and he did this thing ages and ages ago where someone went head-to-head -head with Chris on Star Wars trivia, and they lost mm. horrendously. It was fucking embarrassing. And what I was <laughs> trying to do is I'm like, all right, Matt, you think you love Star Wars, right? And I'm like, and, I, and we set this up where, like, you know, there's no internet or anything like that. You had to do it all by memory, and Bill was basically making sure that Chris was being honest and I was making sure that Matt was being honest. They went head to head mm. with trivia. Now Matt still lost, but it was really fucking close, like way too really? goddamn close <laughs> to the point where Chris is like, you know, your shit, that's not bad. And then Bill was like, even like, wow, I am surprised you did really well. And I'm like, holy fucking shit. You are actually good at something. Matt. <laughs> No, but, like, I don't, because I mean, he spends all of his time reading about all of this various stuff. Like, he's a history fanatic, so he reads about that a ton. He reads about, mm -hmm. like, Star Wars stuff, and I'm sure he knows all of these various stories, like, just getting down rabbit holes late at night while drunk. Like, that's what he does, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. or he'll play video games, but usually he's going down rabbit holes. Like, and you get him going on wrestling trivia, and you will never be able to get him to stop. Like, he knows so much about that and it's the same thing with like even like doctor who stuff and everything where like i know but wrestling is silly <laughs> i've tried so hard with wrestling i really have that's the point <laughs> it's supposed to just be fun it's it's initially oh. it was initially meant for like kids and families to just have a good time and it's sports entertainment it's not supposed to be taken serious and i don't really like the the route that it's really gone um with wwe i've kind of checked out of wwe a long long time ago um and i've almost been tempted to get back into it because of like i guess aew or whatever is like really big right now and like a lot of the people that are into wrestling are like yeah you should check that out if you like the old school stuff and i was big into wrestling well, again when i was i'm like massively biased with aew because i know half the people who are sort of in it working on it around it now get by you know just because of the ddp yoga thing right um, right it yeah, um, uh, that's the wrestling i've been trying to watch and trying to get into and I, i've got 20 minutes of tolerance for the Oh, really? You just stabbed him in the eye with a spike, did you? Uh, to, to try and hamper his chances in the next match. Do you not think the police would turn up and arrest you for GBH? No? No, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. If they're filming in America, <laughs> chances are that won't happen. <laughs> right. Because as we all know, the cops don't help you here. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong show. Wrong show. <laughs> right, right, right. Sorry, sorry. Dial it back, Horton. Dial the hate back. Sorry, all, all this inside baseball stuff, if you're listening to this, ladies and gentlemen, you need to go to Cinema Science and catch that. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Right. Um, but, you know, so, and I didn't even know that Matt was really big into Doctor Who until one day when I was getting set up to record Cinema Psyops with him, I mentioned that I was going to be doing, uh, this was back when Geek Chat Army was still a thing, which is pretty much what you and I do now, only like a, like a group of three or more in the studio all talking mm. um, yeah. in, in my studio uh, or sometimes by Skype. But um, so... I was mentioning that I was getting ready to do that, and Matt looked at me like all hurt, and he's like, "I I want to be on that." I'm like, "Oh," I was like, "Well, I'm a geek." Yeah, and he's like, "No, I, I love Doctor Who," and I'm like, "Oh, I, I didn't know." He's like, "Of course I love Doctor Who." You know, he started naming off all this different stuff, and I'm like, "Jesus, okay." So I put him and uh, my buddy Paul, uh, who is a guy that I worked with, who is like also like super knows everything about the Doctor. Like he's seen them all. Like um, he's the one that helped me acquire all of the Doctor Who. And I mean all of it, like every fucking right. episode. Yeah. And if a new one gets released or comes out somewhere, like they find it in a, somebody's attic in Argentina, which does happen, as soon as it gets restored and it's available, like he'll help me find it. You know what I mean? Like that's that's right. that's what Paul does. Um, <laughs> and I've done the same yeah. where like we've we put together the collection by getting the stuff ourselves. 
And um, so I put Paul okay. and Matt in the studio, and it was basically just an interview thing where I would ask them certain questions, and they both just went off and went into all these deep territories of just various trivia about Doctor Who, and this whole episode just blew up and became like this huge thing. It was, it was really awesome the way, like all the stuff that they were describing. It was, it was pretty fucking awesome <laughs> to be in that room. As a, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I would say I'm a big Doctor Who fan, but I'm nowhere near their level. Like I'm still catching up with a lot of the trivia, and a lot of the stuff that I love from Doctor Who is catching it on PBS as a kid, which is all like Tom Baker. Mm. Like that, that Tom Baker was aired all the time in. You know, when I was a kid, he's, he's my doctor. He will always be my doctor. Yeah, and I, I, I would say that he's my doctor as well. Um, I know a lot of people like, um, like for instance, Paul's is uh, the doctor after him. Um, oh, what is his name? <laughs> uh, that was uh, Peter Davison. Peter Davison, right? And yeah. my wife's because her very, your first doctor is pretty much the doctor that is your doctor for all time. Um, my wife's is David Tennant, even yeah. though her first was Christopher Eccleston. He sucked balls, so she went straight to. <laughs> she went straight to loving he Dead wasn't Tennant. great <laughs> he, you know what he was the name they needed to launch it and get it started he did exactly what he said he was yes. going to do and those episodes are fine they're just like mean, david Tennant just knocked it out of the park but what's really funny I've, is I've just paul's favorite doctor and bev's favorite doctor um like are related now david Tennant is technically peter davison's son-in-law he oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, David oh, Tennant's wife nerdism. is his daughter, is Peter Davison's daughter. And she actually was... That's she, weird. She was on the show <laughs> as the doctor's, quote-unquote, the doctor's daughter is the show that she was on, and that's, I think, how they met. And um, oh. they genetically cloned the doctor, and then she goes off and has adventures. She never shows up again after that episode. But that's how they met, and now they're married. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> yeah, and I found that out on that show, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm bringing oh. it up. <laughs> Is your phone anywhere near you? Yes. Um, I just put a picture in the group. Have a quick look. Does it look familiar? Is that the um, daffodil or the the painting that they did with uh, uh, Van Gogh whenever they went to visit him from Doctor Who? It is. <laughs> oh no, shit! That's the one that gets put in the TARDIS, right? Yep. Oh wow! The actual. That's the actual thing. Yeah. Um. So one of my, I, I can't say this, but I am because he's never going to listen to this. If he finds it, then I'll just go with a lawsuit. Um, one of my customers is the partner of the guy who designed that and many other props for Doctor Who for those seasons. Apparently he had a Cyberman upstairs. I never got to see it. Um, That's a bit of a shame. fucking amazing. Well, OK, so all you're telling me is that you worked for a client and then you sent me a friend, a photo of you with that photo, like with that that particular prop that's, yeah, that's hanging that's up non-specific yeah exactly but they, he was quite mm, be careful what you do with that photo so i was like okay fine right um, so you're not pretty cool you're not posting it online you're just showing that you were there with it so and yeah, i guess yeah I, I just thought you'd be interested no that's <laughs> but, that's yeah. fucking amazing actually <laughs> i actually took that for my friend emma because um she was i don't know if she still does but they her and her husband run the biggest doctor who fan site uh, in the uk and used to do a show um, about Doctor Who. I think maybe bringing something back soon. Um, so I took that for her because it was like, yeah, you got to see this. Look where I am. <laughs> so she was made up. I said, no, it's fine. I'm not going to post it online or anything. It's just for a friend. So, but I thought, now you've mentioned that, I've got to show you. <laughs> well, that that episode um, where they go and visit Vincent Van Gogh is like my probably my wife's favorite all time episode ever. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'll yeah. Give her it, a copy of that picture. Well, then. she's uh, she's she's an artist. So when they go to visit Van Gogh as an artist and then he finds out like how long his work endures, it makes her ball his reaction, you know, and like it's, she just course, loses yeah. it. Like, and I'm getting misty. I just mentioning it, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, the other one, the one that works for me the most is, uh, and it's the Chris, one of the Christopher Eccleston episodes. It's the end of the one where they meet Charles Dickens and it's like a Christmas episode and there's like people being brought back from the dead by these gas like aliens or whatever. I think it's called gaslight or whatever, but it's this, um, the Charles Dickens just ends up asking him like to do my works in door. And like, he just basically tells him how like his work will live on for like ever. And like the reaction he gives for that is another thing that's like super emotional. I just absolutely love that too. So, mm. but because she loved that Vincent van Gogh one so much, um, the, our friend Jeremy, who does now the Deuce podcast, which I believe is going to be wrapping up soon, 
Um, I know they're coming close. I don't know if they've fully pulled the trigger on wrapping up or not. Uh, and then was also a, a, an integral part of Geek Chat Army with me. Uh, he bought us a poster of the painting of the TARDIS exploding done by Van Gogh whenever there was like warnings of stuff coming. I don't know if it was for Bad Wolf or what. Uh, for what yeah, it, I remember. Yeah, that's a great picture. But it's basically like a copy of Starry Night, but instead of it being a Starry Night, it's the explosion of the TARDIS. <laughs> and that hangs yeah. above our couch in our upstairs living room. Like, oh, amazing. So when you walk <laughs> when you walk in our house and like survey, it's like probably one of the things that'll draw your eye. It's like right there. Wicked. Yeah. That's what I love about this show. I never like we we said we're getting on mic. Uh, don't know what to talk about. It's like I don't care. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah, we like we, have, we never know where it's gonna go. <laughs> we have almost two shows worth of material right here. You could almost record a second intro and just chop it together, right? Uh, I would never do that. Um, <laughs> so. I'm suggesting that you should. <laughs> Oh, I don't. I, I, I find those don't... The, the flow doesn't work if one doesn't. Anyway, I'm going to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to remember the time marker. Um, Well, I w the only other thing I was going to sort of try and do with this show was sort of catch up from... Like, if any... Well, what I'm thinking is if somebody finds this show and goes, oh, I'll go back, check out what they did before, and they'll be completely disjointed from the other two, perhaps. Um, And obviously, last time we talked about... I talked about the upcoming trip to Dubai, which was like going to be like one of the most ridiculous trips of my life um, of what was slated. And I thought I could sort of feed back on the reality of what actually happened. Um, oh, and, and uh, you, I think you had the draft house uh, Halloween thing. Yeah. Um, OK, you go ahead and get started. Give me two ticks. I'm going to go grab the poster of all the shows that we actually made. Um, okay. There was a the, the draft house, the Alamo draft house, and you can leave all this in; it's totally fine. But the Alamo draft house actually, um, they had posters that were like the calendar of events for the draft house of horrors. And brilliant, yeah, I grabbed one of them. It's an eleven by seventeen poster, and then I bought these little like um, marker stickers that were like these blood, like drops of blood, and they have little <laughs> smiley faces on them, and some have like little bows for like ladies and stuff like that, and some are just regular blood drops with smiley faces and. You know, various emojis <laughs> that are blood drops. So we put one on for me and one on for my wife for every movie that we attended. And if we attended together, there's one each, obviously. And then one's, one's got a bow for her and then one's just a regular one for me. And then um, if there was one that we used her ticket with a friend of mine, then I put two of dudes because we were there together. Okay. <laughs> so let me grab that real <laughs> awesome quick. Idea. And uh, it's right out the door. So just take two shakes, okay? No worries. All right. Um, well, I'm going to talk about another thing <clears throat> in the interim. Uh, obviously Christmas happened between our last show and this one. Yes, that's how long it's been. And um, my, my family don't necessarily pay attention to my podcasting exploits. <clears throat> Not that there's many of those these days. They do a show a year for Little Pot of Horrors. Um, but in in my little sort of bag of presents and stocking fillers, I got this push button thing. Um, and it's a big red push button. And it just says across the front, bullshit. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's like did you know about the podcast I'm like no we just thought that was very you so if I push it <laughs> you should use that bullshit. I think that's my favorite one yeah I like that one okay so <clears throat> the bag has a button that says bullshit or is a button that says no, no it's just a freestanding button with a battery and a big red button I've seen I've it. actually seen this <laughs> And it's very British. <laughs> oh, that's... Well, if it was very British, I wouldn't say bullshit. No. Nobody says that. <laughs> Where'd you get that from? <laughs> I don't know. I'm American. Oh, what's that thing? That, twat. None of us say that either. Twat. Twat. Remember? Yeah, twat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was, was one fun. of the most fun uh, little bits that Matt and I have recorded, because he was purposely saying it wrong, so I would, like, press the button again. <laughs> <laughs> it really made me chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got the poster. Well, you go first. Sir. Get your poster. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've got the. I've got the poster. We can post a picture to this on the show notes, or whatever, if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, mm -hmm. some of the emojis are like sad blood drops, and then some are happy blood drops. So, if my wife didn't like it, or right. you were disappointed that we tried to color coordinate it that way. Um. <laughs> so October first was a Tuesday that year, 
And the choice was once bitten on 35 millimeter in the La Vista or Midtown at the Lost Boys. And we decided to go with the Lost Boys instead. Anybody who's yeah. seen Once Bitten, it's a Jim Carrey movie. And it's, I mean, the fact that it was 35 millimeter kind of almost drew me in. And then I'm like, no, it's still Once Bitten. I'll go with the Lost Boys. <laughs> and it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, the next night we saw Forbidden World. Which had me, uh, my blood drop has a uh, confused eye look where like the one eyebrow's cocked up, like what the hell? And then the other one for my <laughs> wife is angry. She did not like Forbidden World. We covered that on Cinema PsyOps, if anybody's curious. I made Matt watch that because as soon as I finished it, I'm like, Matt has to see this because I, I had the Blu-ray at the time. <laughs> uh, then we did a screening the next day, the third. Um, Daniel isn't real. We both went to that. They're both smiley faces. Um Yes, this is one I said I was excited that you were going to see it. So really interested to know what you thought. Uh, I was absolutely loving it until they did, and let's just say, a supernatural twist. And it's on Shudder for anybody that's interested and they want to check it out. The actual supernatural version of the twist, I didn't like. Now, right. um, because they were doing such a wonderful job of showing what it feels like to have um, disassociation and to not really be in control of yourself and to have like almost like a multiple personality disorder or, um, dissociative identity disorder is actually the term that they prefer now. And I thought that mm. that stuff was all excellent. And then when they turned it into no demons, I was, I, I kind of lost a little bit of respect for that, but it is, I would say 75 to 85% awesome. And then it shits the bed at the end on me. You see, I, the first time I saw it, I thought I'd seen it. Um, obviously I saw it at Fright Fest, uh, this UK premiere, and uh, I know I nodded off, and I thought I'd nodded off for about three minutes. I then caught the film after we spoke uh, at the Celluloid Screams Film Festival, they played it, and I got to see the whole thing, and I, I enjoyed it much more with the bit I didn't sleep through, which apparently was 20 fucking minutes, which explains why when I was stood outside the bar with the director of the film, I couldn't talk to him about his film at all because I didn't really have an opinion yet. <laughs> that makes sense. It was so bad. We talked about him making a horror movie about meerkats. I can't remember if I mentioned that last time. I may have done. Um, because I was just trying to find awkward... Let's not talk about his movie. I mean, to be honest, if you're a director at a film festival, you don't want a fan just blabbing on about the movie that you made that he just saw, probably. Like, if it's a Q and a or a signature thing later, but like, if it's way later on, like in a social setting, I guess, I, I don't think I'd want to talk about the movie. Um, so there's this very strange exchange where he wanted to make a horror movie about meerkats, and I explained that you can't do that because meerkats, in the, well, not in the UK, because they're so beloved as uh, insurance selling uh, animated animals on television in ad breaks <laughs> sort of like trying to make a gecko horror film here yeah 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 exactly yeah <laughs> so, All right. um but no I, the second time through it, it landed much better with me and i didn't mind the supernatural element now actually. that's my first impression um, i have not gone back to watch it because i just want to let it sit for a little while mm. before i go back and now that it's on shutter i'm just going to let it sit there you know i'm also kind of wondering if it's going to show up on joe bob's show because mm. I wasn't going to watch A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and then it ended up on Joe Bob's show, so then I watched it. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Did you like that? I never caught that yet, actually. Um, it's more art film than horror, and a little too art film for me. Um, it's very mumblecore, and it just... Oh, no. Yeah, I, I, I mean, <laughs> like, there, I found things that I liked about it, but mostly that particular film just... it. I just don't think I'm the audience. Right. You know, it's just, it's a little too mm. art filmy for me. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next night, which would be that Friday, the 4th of October, I then went to see the Dawn of the Dead 3D edition. They did like this um, digitization where they did 3D um, effects on top of it. And my buddy Alex oh. and I went to see that because my wife does volleyball or something or something along those lines where she couldn't make that showing. So I went and saw the Dawn mm. of the Dead in 3D. And I got to say, that was unfucking believably cool. It's the, really? it's the original. Oh, it's the original Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, they don't really change it, and it's more or less the theatrical cut that everybody would know from the theatrical version of the film. And what mm. they end up doing is they use three D effects to basically pump up the depth of field. So right. whenever you're looking at the mall, the zombies look uh. even further back, and you can see even more, and it it really increases the feeling of the depth of field. Um, Brilliant. 
when they do have stuff that would normally like be bla- blasting at the screen, like if uh, blood hits the camera in a couple of scenes, they actually mm. make chunks of stuff that's digi- digitally done that they kind of cut out some of the stuff that's flying at the screen before it hits the camera, and then they make it hit come out at you. <laughs> nice. So like one of the one of the ones that I'm talking about is there's like a there's several heads getting blown off, but like a head gets blown off with a shotgun, and the blood goes mm. and hits the camera, and then they hard cut. And as the blood goes to hit the camera, it actually comes out and like it looks like it, it, it hits you in the face because it awesome. smears right in front of you. Like and it looked incredible. It was so but much this fucking is, fun. That's the argument I've made about 3D. Like because th- there's this whole thing of snobbishness about 3D movies. Like, they're going away sadly, but is that oh, I don't want things just lobbed at my head. I'm like fuck off. That's exactly what I want. I get the depth of field thing for certain movies, but if I'm watching an action or a horror movie, I want you to chuck stuff at my head. And Texas, Texas Chainsaw 3D, I was so disappointed at the lack of um, blades coming towards my face. That's what I fucking signed up for. But Oh no, it's about the artistic depth of field. Fuck off. Throw a pigeon at my head. Honestly. You can do so, both and just do it well. Yes. Yeah. And here's the thing. like yeah. All of the stuff being thrown at your head... Or the things that were coming out of the screen. What they ended up doing is if you're in the thick of the zombies, in some cases it felt like some of the zombies were like outside of the screen a little bit too. Like when the film was going Mm. in or driving past them, you felt like you were actually going past them because the screen, all of it popped out at you to have like a depth of field. So it felt like you were not necessarily in in the movie, like virtual reality style, but almost like where it was surrounding you, like you're watching a curved screen. And it goes nice. off to your your depth of field to the, the the like the right or the left of you, like just to the the edge of your vision, which was actually really neat. Um, the few things that had anything going at the camera anyway, where it would splat the camera or something like that in the film for that splatter effect, that was the stuff that they made sure that they brought things flying at your head, which would naturally make sense. You know, yeah. this movie was already shot, and then they added the 3D effects, and I really like. I'm against that because I think it's lame, but they did this well. This is one of the best versions of a 3D done film later that I've seen. And I, I hope that eventually they will release that somewhere else. But that's Richard Rubenstein, so I don't even know. Like, that's all Richard Rubenstein. He just did that to milk people for more money. So I don't know how that's going to turn out. <laughs> I want that on uh, 3D Blu-ray, but I can't. Uh, I'll probably keep wishing for that, won't I? Yeah, I don't know if it'll ever happen. It's more likely to happen on your shores than mine. Because mm. Rubenstein actually doesn't own the rights or can't control the rights overseas um or he can't ask a ridiculous price overseas in in like the european market which is why i think it's second sight is doing that wonderful blu-ray box set that replicates what anchor bay did ages ago on dvd where it's all the cuts of the film the various cuts of the film um all the hopefully the special features that exist will be ported over and new ones will be added and i'm keeping my eye on that but that's going to be all blu-ray and i can't wait for that Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, So the next night, uh, the Saturday, it was an all-day Italian giallo marathon. Now, I don't remember (laughs) all of the films. I do know that we had Dario Argento's opera. Um, Jeez, I can't think of them all. Uh, Lizard in a Woman's Skin, which is a Lucio Fulci's jolly, which was actually really good. Um, There's like four or five movies. It's basically you go in a little bit around noon or two or so. And then you're there until the theater closes. It's like eight, oh. eight to nine hours of movies. And they have these little breaks that you take in between the movies where you can get up. Um, then the wait staff will come in and clean up all of the stuff that you, you know, your, your cups and your, your food dishes and everything. Um, I love all, all day marathons at the Alamo draft house. It's like one of my favorite things, particularly about this draft house of horrors. Anytime they have a marathon of, of any sort of, if I'm even remotely interested in the genre they're doing the marathon of, I'm going Whenever I can again in the future, obviously. Um, I love marathons. Yeah, but this was this was absolutely incredible. It was an amazing theater experience, and that was at the Midtown. Um, you can look it up if you really want to. The Draft House of Horrors for this past year, the 2019, the Italian Jello Marathon was really awesome. Then that Sunday, that's when I think my wife was bowling, so I went by myself to see the Australian masterpiece, question mark, Body Melt. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I know of it. <laughs> I do have to say, um, it, it. I've seen it before this. I had seen a VHS um, copy of it. It was one of my tape trader day things, 
like like back in the tape traders days i i i found a copy of it and, and saw it and then i caught it again um i think it was like on amazon prime there was like a similar like four by three version of it that was out there this mm. this version was a restored version of body melt and the wide angle shots that they do to distort the faces and make everybody look off and make you just feel awkward and weird um mm. it just worked so much better and I was uncomfortable and uneasy almost the entire time I was watching the film, on top of the fact that it gets super gross and melty and just everything is weird. Uh, to, give people, <laughs> to give people an idea, it's the same kind of um, comedy ideal that you would get from like a Dead Alive or um, Brain Dead, whatever you want to call it, or even... Um, uh, oh, Brain Dead, that's what it's actually called. Yeah, yeah. Brain Dead or... <laughs> yeah, I prefer Brain Dead too, but Brain Dead or... Um, <laughs> Bad Taste, though, the one with the alien invasion. It's actually a little bit closer to uh, Bad Taste because it's probably about the same budget, give or take. Did you have to drink some Chuck? <laughs> no, not necessarily, but that's what Body Melt was like, <laughs> and it was a shitload of fun. It was a restored version, and it was amazing. Um, cool. Then Monday the 7th, I did not go to the theater because I was recording my show. Right. Then that Tuesday, we went to the documentary Wolfman's Got Nards. And the special, ah. the special guests there were the filmmakers, and one of them being the young kid, Andre Gower, who, well, the young man, who now a full-grown adult is probably older than me, Andre Gower, who played <laughs> Sean, the main character, uh, in Monster Squad. And it's about the making of Monster Squad, the endurance of the film, and how it's become such a cult phenomenon, and how everybody's so obsessed with it. It's actually a really excellent documentary, and uh, pretty fucking cool, and gives you a lot of ideas of like how it's affected not only the people that were in its lives who had no idea just how incredibly popular this film had become much later on until like the days that they were trying to get the DVD released and then they reunited the cast and stuff. And also uh, it focuses a lot on Shane Black and um, Fred Decker's reactions to how the film was marketed and how it basically failed and kind of shows just how bitter Fred Decker kind of is about the movie and like his lot in life for how things have happened for his filmmaking career. And it's pretty justifiable because he's gotten fucked over plenty of times while mm. his roommate and friend, Shane Black has, you know, made fortunes upon fortunes for being the guy who sets everything on Christmas. He's done all right. <laughs> I mean, he's only written like <laughs> lethal weapon and die hard and a bunch of other action movies. He, hell, he was even actually in predator. He was one of the guys in predator. Didn't he write Predator? Yes. I know you wrote pr the new Predators. I think he wrote the, wrote the things. I well. think he wrote yeah. the original Predator, and he's actually in the film, The Predator. Um, whenever they throw something at one of the guy's heads that's wearing glasses and he catches it without even looking, that's Shane Black. Yeah. Um, um, he, he also wrote one of my favorite films, um, which is uh, Last Boy Scout. Oh, you and my mother so have something in common. She absolutely loves The Last Boy Scout, and it's also set in Christmas. I love that film so much. It's it's one of his better written films. I am a huge fan of Monster Squad, which he wrote. Um, and I love a lot of the action films that he wrote. Um, my favorite of his action films is actually one that probably most people wouldn't even consider or look twice at. But that's Long Kiss Goodnight because Gina Davis mm. is amazing. And Yes, that's a great film. And in that film, I absolutely love every incarnation of her, but so much more when she becomes the badass killer that swears like a sailor. <laughs> Well, yeah, because she'd done so many sort of twee nice girl roles. I mean, even in Beetlejuice and things like that, she was always this the sweet butter wouldn't melt kind of character. She was always and... an ingenue, and this was the film that showed mm. that she had so much depth and badassery. Um, I know yeah. a lot of people malign uh, Cutthroat Island, but I really like that film too, where she's like a pirate captain. Um, mm. Mostly because I have an uncontrollable, con like just huge fucking rut, like crush on uh, Gina Davis. Like it's uncontrollable. <laughs> <laughs> was that a Freudian slip there? <laughs> he said a huge fucking rod for Gina Davis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it was a Freudian slip. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to say the tremendous erection, but you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, I slipped either's valid. Yeah, either is very true. Um, oh, you must love Earth Girls Are Easy then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I also really, really don't like Jeff Goldblum, and they were together for a while. So watching them in The Fly, and then also Earth Girls Are Easy, is really rough. My personal ah, okay. favorite role to see Gina Davis walking around in is actually Transylvania Six Five Thousand because she's wearing a very revealing vampirus outfit. 
Oh, I haven't seen that. Ooh, I'll have to get you a copy. There then. you go. You've had the gap in my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, after that, there was a special guest screening that had Mark Patton, the actor from uh, Night on, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, with his uh, documentary that he created with a couple of gentlemen. It's called Scream, comma, Queen. I think it's called My Nightmare on Elm Street is the subtitle for that. Um, yep, it is. That is a <laughs> that is an extremely powerful film. Um, I... It was very. I heard. It's very moving. <laughs> it's um. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, he did a meet and greet afterwards, and I got to sobbingly apologize to him for my part in the fandom deriding the film based solely upon the homosexuality content that was in it, and being partially responsible for basically killing his career because of that because of one of the mm. fans that, that did that. And it essentially, the film essentially outs him and basically wrecked his career. Nightmare on Elm Street 2, that is. And Scream yeah. Queen deals with that in a very serious, very somber tone. And while some people may look at it and think that it's very self-serving, I really don't. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's about healing. And that's what he said to me too, because I, literally I was bawling. And he's like, it's, you were a baby. How is that even your fault? I'm like, no, this was up until just a few years ago before I realized using that term like to, to to refer to something as gay is so derisive whenever you're using it to be a derisive term you know and i was like mm. and i didn't know the damage that that would do to someone that may be homosexual and i you know i was trying to explain that to him he's like it's not you you're you weren't the problem and i'm like yes but i'm still atoning for it and he's like just come here and he he walked around like he got up and like walked around and forcefully hugged me and just like come here Aww. he's like it's okay it's not your fault you know and then, uh, Amazing. then, uh, we took pictures together. It was a really, it was a very beautiful moment. It was really awesome. And there's like a whole shitload of people behind me in line. That's seeing this guy that's built like a railroad spike. That's like, you know, like the squat dwarf that looks like he could probably kill you hugging this man and just like, just like bawling and like saying how sorry he is. And he was so sweet and so kind and so wonderful. And it was such a, a, a just a, a, a great fucking moment. Um, I ended up, I asked him what his favorite headshot was because I wanted to help because uh, they, they, a lot of the money for the touring to be able to, to present the, the film is based on selling merch afterwards and that kind of stuff. So hmm. um, I ended up buying a picture of Mark Patton. Um, he's, it's the one where Jesse's got the glove after he kills the gym teacher. And I asked him what his favorite headshot of all the ones that he had to offer was. And he pointed that one. I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. And then when we went to take a photo, he surprise kissed me on the cheek when they were taking a photo of me with him. Oh, and <laughs> nice. Yeah, and he was actually, he had just told a story about how um, he had kissed David Bowie, like David Bowie had given him a kiss um, at one of the productions that he was at on stage. You know, it was, uh, I think it was David Mammy who's coming to visit him or something like that, and they'd met, and then David Bowie kissed him, and as he's kissing me on the cheek and I'm getting photos taken, I'm like, and these are the lips that kissed David Bowie. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the first thing that came to my blown. mind. Yeah, and I was just like, "That's amazing," you know. And he was, and it was a very, very sweet, very gentle kiss. And you know, it just instantly made me feel like everything was going to be okay, and that you know, mm. whatever, whatever harm I had done, I have more than atoned for, kind of, you know. And yeah. so that's a little behind the scenes for everybody that wonders why I'm so mm, anti homophobia, like why I'm so like fervent to bite that is because part of it is I was part of the problem before and I'm going to be part of the solution for the rest of my life. Awesome. Um, the next night was, <laughs> so I just, just to interject, I, I was supposed to see that film, um, at the Soho horror festival, which I love, which is only a couple of days uh, in November. And it was just as this data, this database thing I've been working on at work was launching over that weekend. And just before that film played, I got the notification. The system had gone live my hoodie was in the cinema on my seat. So I sat outside the screening room hearing all of the reactions as people watch that movie. Then I hear them Skype, the gentleman you were just talking about, and the interactions between everybody in the room and him over Skype. And then everybody coming out. I was sitting testing this fucking database. I was gutted. Because oh. <laughs> I'd heard good things about it. It played at Fright Fest in August. And I was, I was looking forward to seeing it. And uh, <laughs> that, I then had to pack my shit and then drive three hours north. So I missed the rest of the festival. But I mean, you know, shit happens. But um, the crowd reaction I heard, just, <laughs> it's almost worse because you're like, 
oh that that really hit home with everybody and people were coming out in tears um and i say the reaction to him on the call was uh, incredible yeah it's it's a very powerful uh, really well shot film um i will catch it the filmmakers that worked with him to make this happen um that follow him and just kind of helped put this the whole documentary together they're really talented i expect big things from them uh it's it is it's a it drove my hard ass to tears and made me realize (laughs) you know like i had been subconsciously overdoing it trying to be part of the solution for a long time and not knowing why and it wasn't until i watched that film that i had that epiphany (laughs) <laughs> yeah okay so i get that uh the next night was um the option was either resident evil in midtown or 35 millimeter <laughs> teen wolf which my wife and i were both super excited by and then <laughs> no contest <laughs> we went to see teen wolf and that film does not hold up to any warm and fuzzy memories that you have even on 35 millimeter and it is oh. super homophobic and there's a bunch of qu- questionable jokes and things in that like every 80s comedy so both my wife and uh, I have like kind of ish faces. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, of course. Sometimes the memories are best left, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, but I don't regret seeing it in 35 millimeter because that was an experience. Mm. You know, the scratches and everything like that on the film. Uh, following night was Evil Dead, the 4K restoration. Uh, looks amazing. Do not like the new score at all. Oh, they did a new score? They added a new score to it, and here's the problem that I have with the new score. It works too well. Um, It takes takes away the feeling of the movie. Um, It draws attention to itself too much, if you catch my drift. And I don't know if Mm. it's because I have the other movie basically memorized no it's memorized i I have the other evil dead memorized and i was gonna say yeah it's it's like this this does not compute this does not compute right and so like i think my brain was fighting against that um they they developed the sound much better uh also they cleaned it up a lot so if you're a big fan of being able to see the matte shot whenever they dump the ink in the tank uh over the moon to simulate clouds Mm. and stuff like that if if you like the flaws in the evil dead you may not like the 4k restoration version but if they uh, if they have an option where you can see it without the cleaned up matte lines and all that kind of stuff, it's just the restored and 4K, then that'd be awesome. But I, I don't know. But the version I saw, they, it was a little too cleaned up for my taste. How does the plaster scene look? The what scene? The plaster scene. How does it look? The plaster scene? Yeah. Do you know what a plaster scene is? <laughs> oh, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> Describe to me what a plaster scene is. <clears throat> hey, Siri. What's plasticine in American? <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, Wikipedia. Um, duh, duh, duh. It doesn't say. Other no, there's no otherwise known as. It's basically modeling clay that we used as kids, but it doesn't set. Oh, okay. So how, like how putty? Okay, how does all the claymation that they did? Is claymation is what I know it as, or or stop motion animation with clay. Uh, claymation yeah, is actually I, a claymation is actually a um a, a copyrighted or trademark term. Uh, okay. they didn't clean that up. Obviously, there's not much they could do to <laughs> to fix that. So it's still very much as as rough and tumble as you would expect. Um, I will say this: the demon arms that bust out of the out of them at the end whenever that growl ha- happens and then the arms bust out and you see demon arms swiping around mm. that still scares the shit out of me every time that happens i jump okay. scare every fucking time <laughs> doesn't matter how many times i've seen the movie doesn't know i mean i could even count to when it's going to happen i still fucking jump i don't know why um but that looked incredible as well and all the all the stop motion animation stuff looked every bit as rough and tumble as you're you're used to um okay and also you can <laughs> tell that it's oatmeal coming out of shirt sleeves <laughs> yes so much but it was the not. voices in that film that fucked me up when I saw it. it they enhanced the, the pos- them and they made the it kind better. of possession. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, because that really messed with me. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't know why. Okay. The twelfth, um, the next Saturday was the next. Every Saturday they had a full fledged marathon. This one right. was in the La Vista Alamo Draft House because they're set up to be able to project film, and it was Teenage Wasteland Marathon, all on thirty five millimeter film. This is all mm. Scream, uh, Urban Legend. Um, oh, right. Uh, I know what you did last summer, which I fucking slept through, and I'm proud to say that. <laughs> um, so dull. And I can't remember. Final Destination was the last one, I believe. All on 35 millimeter film. 
Okay. Um, I don't remember the exact order, but I know Scream was first, and I'm positive Final Destination was last. I think Urban Legend was second because I slept through most of and parts of I Know What You Did Last Summer because that bores the shit out of me. That movie's terrible. Um, well, imagine they put Final Destination on as a second movie. <laughs> you looked at it and gone, whoever programmed this, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because it blows most of the other ones away. To me, I love Final Destination. Like, I think that's... I'm just thinking in terms of the name. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's got the word final in it. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Seeing all of these on 35mm film in a theater experience, and it was a pretty packed crowd, even for a marathon. Um, Obviously, some people left after their favorite movie played, which makes sense, but my wife and I stuck it out for all of them. This was the one my wife was the most excited for. The Italian Giallo was the one that I was the most excited for. Right. Um, the the scream and all of that kind of stuff. The '90s horror is the stuff that my wife loves. I'm not a fan of the. Everybody who's heard Duncan's show, tea, teapots of me talking the '90s horror, I've already vented my frustrations there. So we'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Sunday, I then went and watched Val Luton's The Body Snatcher. That is a classic black and white film starring Boris Karloff, and I believe Bella okay. Lugosi's in it as well. Uh, that's an amazing film. Val Luton films are worth your fucking time to go back and see, even though black and white and slower paced films may bore some of us. Boz. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really well-made film. It's very, very creepy, and it's about grave robbing. So it 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 tickled my funny bone. I loved it. Uh, yes. Then uh, I skipped. I actually recorded Tuesday that week. So we went and saw the Stephen Summers 1990s The Mummy, and it's called A Movie Party. Movie parties, they give you props to interact with the screen. You're allowed to quote along, but you're not supposed to be an asshole and talk over the film. Um, right. You can't shout out the quote before the person says it, but you can quote along with it. And you're not supposed to like shout, shout, but you can say it loud enough so everybody around you knows that you know the film. Uh, mm. That was a shitload of fun. The Mummy's not a great film, but if you <laughs> if you don't mind watching Raiders of the Lost Ark and if you have a thing for Rachel Wise like I do, it's fun for you to watch. It's right. And my <laughs> it's the right kind of corny action fun that my wife absolutely loves. She loves that kind of movie. Like the mummy's like right up her alley. That's a, her jam. Um the digital effects look even worse now. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they haven't held up as well as the plasticine from Evil Dead. Right. Yeah. There's not at all. Today's word, right. plasticine. Plasticine, my new British term. Um not plasticine, plasticine. Right, plasticine. <laughs> Um, so Tuesday I was recording and I missed one cut of the dead, but that was on shutter at the time. So my wife and I went and watched that later. Uh, incredible. Everyone should check it out if they haven't seen it. (laughs) Yeah. I love that film. Lavinia still will not sit through the shit bit at the beginning. (laughs) What is this shit? Turn it off. Trust me. Stick with it. No. (laughs) Or or she just falls asleep. It's like, we still haven't made the end of it, but I'm going to get her to finish that movie. (laughs) Uh, the Wednesday after that? It'd be an anticlimax now, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, probably. Or just skip the shit <laughs> bit at the beginning and then just have her jump right in and be like, no, trust me, you won't want to watch before this. <laughs> but then none of it makes sense. Oh, Fair okay. enough. Um, <laughs> the next night we saw Wes Craven's Shocker on 35mm film. I w- God, I used to have that on VHS. I haven't seen it in about 20 years. I own it on DVD, and I also bought a high-definition print off of Vudu to be able to watch it. Um, wow. because not because I like the film, but because I enjoy watching it. Do you get what I'm saying here? It's, yeah, it's yeah. not good. It's fucking terrible, but it is so mm. much fucking fun to watch and watching it in 35 millimeter was actually pretty awesome. Um, some of these movies, depending upon what you go to, they have a host. Some of them don't. I remember that shocker had a host because that host had trivia questions about Wes Craven and I knew every single question, but only <laughs> answered three of the four, um, and won okay. three prizes from the guy. <laughs> it'd be nice to somebody else right. yeah. and and like and like i waited literally like till nobody else knew and then I, I raised my hand and said it and um i actually was trying to get somebody else i was like trying to tell somebody else like oh from me i'm like no no it's, that's not it that's, that's not it and like they were all they were all like <laughs> what i thought were give me questions but apparently were really difficult ones um for instance like uh what state is springwood in i wouldn't know that ohio springwood ohio <laughs> nope <laughs> yeah see and i knew that and i was like and everybody like three or four people guessed it wrong and he's like oh, i guess nobody's gonna get that one and then i raised my hand and he goes you sir ohio yes and he's like <laughs> he's like you knew that and you let all these other people answer i'm like yeah i was trying to be nice because i had already answered one and i won like a west craven trivia book um like he gave me a cd soundtrack it was basically like this guy's collection of west craven memorabilia that he wanted to unload on somebody it was all used but 
it was still it was a trivia <laughs> prizes that I was winning, and I knew every like like I said, I knew all four of them, and they and like only answered three of them. <laughs> And literally waited. Like, I, I got the first one, and then I waited on all the other ones till nobody else would answer. And then finally, somebody got the fourth one themselves. <laughs> and you're like, I can't do it again. I'll be the asshole. <laughs> right, right. And that's that's literally what I said. And he's like, he's like, anybody, anybody? And then I raised my hand, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I wanted to wait to see if anybody else had a chance. <laughs> and I'm usually not that polite, but I, you know, I like a horror crowd. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the next night we saw Nightmare on Elm Street as a movie party. That was pretty awesome, except the person who was hosting it, um, whenever she activated her mic in the theater next to us to screen the next ver- next screening of Nightmare on Elm Street for a movie party, it came into our theater instead, and she didn't know why. <laughs> so we heard her whole spiel that she was doing all over again in our oh, theater. No. Right, embarrassing. Right at the end of the film as Nancy and Freddie are fighting. No, that enhanced the film for me. That was fun. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, that Friday we did not attend. Neither of us attended because it was a Rosemary's Baby, the Tenant double feature, and uh, fuck Roman Polanski. Not because I dislike oh, yeah. his filmmaking, yeah. because I dislike the man himself. And no. Yep. <laughs> and actually, I should probably x that out on the ma- on on the calendar here and say fuck Roman Polanski underneath. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Now I've still never seen that movie. You know? Oh well. Rosemary's Baby and The Tenet are all both excellent films, but fuck Roman Polanski. Uh, <laughs> that Saturday, the marathon was Howl at the Moon. They're f- all werewolf. I feel like I've seen that. All werewolf oh, movies. Oh, right. Yeah. All werewolf <laughs> movies. Oh, with you. That was the title of the whole thing. This, so I'm thinking, I don't think I've seen that movie. <laughs> this is the one that my wife was the most excited for, but she could only sit through half of it because there was some type of a get together with friends that she was going to go do. And I was like, no, I'm staying for this. You go by yourself. I'm staying for this. This is, this is my jam. So the, I mean, werewolves are my like fave and there's a, there's a film in production coming, um, made by some people I know. Um, and I've seen some of the stills of the werewolf costumes. Stuff. I'm like so fucking excited to see that movie. <laughs> uh, it was, American Werewolf in London, important to point that out. Has to be. Yeah. Has to be. <laughs> um, they didn't do Joe Dante's The Howling, unfortunately. I'm really, really? sad about that. Oh. The okay. guy who programs it went real artsy film with it and decided to do ah. Brotherhood of the Wolf instead. Ooh. That's not a werewolf not so movie, good. dude. There's, it's not it's, at all. It's not, no. It, it's shit. The cl- <laughs> uh, Bev had I, the same I, well, opinion. Um, she was hoping for this. She was hoping to be able to see American Werewolf in London. And Dog Soldiers was the third film. (gasps) Yes. Now, the problem was she was hoping that they would do American Werewolf in London and then Dog Soldiers, and then she could leave at the end of Dog Soldiers. What they did was American Werewolf in London, the snooze fest that is Brotherhood of the Wolf, um, (laughs) which is not a werewolf movie, but because it's some kind of a foreign film, the guy who programs it decided he wanted to put it on there. Um, I don't know why, because it's artsy. And then Dog Soldiers was next, which is probably my favorite werewolf movie, just for yeah, shits and giggles too. and enjoyment. It's so fucking good, and they do the werewolf so much justice there. And then... I hope I'll give you the shits. Right. Oh, you know what it was? It was actually Wolfen, and then um, Brotherhood. So it was... Uh, uh, Wolfen was first, then Brotherhood of the Wolf, then um, Dog Soldiers, so my wife missed it, and then it ended with uh. American Werewolf in London, as it should. Ah, right, okay. But that was an amazing fucking marathon. I had so much fucking fun. Um, <laughs> my wife had to leave early, so all she got to see was Woofen and Brotherhood of the Wolf, and she felt very cheated because neither one of those are technically werewolf movies. No. I mean, it could have been worse. It could have been Wolf with Jan Nicholson. Yeah, but also James Spader is super greasy and says the line, does she look like the fuck of the century or what, which really makes me feel creeped out. <laughs> Just even <laughs> saying it. So there's some moats that. Um, yeah. Then that Sunday was, I forget, something happened that I wasn't able to go. So we skipped that Sunday, the 20th. Um, Monday, I recorded for my podcast. And then, oh, mon- Tuesday, the 22nd. This was so much fucking fun, Boz. Rocky Horror <laughs> Picture Show movie party. So it was basically, <laughs> you had props. You had all the stuff that you have to do, like to, to shoot the water in the air, newspapers to cover uh, your head. Right. Um, yeah. They gave us squirt guns, a newspaper to cover our head. Um, <laughs> I can't all the all the basically all the props that you needed, except for like throwing toast and stuff like that. Although some people had brought toast themselves. Of course, uh, it's Rocky Horror. Right. Somebody's going to. <laughs> right. 
Um, <laughs> the quotes were amazing. There were variations where people were doing call out and responses or uh, um, the first time I saw it live uh, a stage production and there are like clearly ones that have been going doing the rounds for years I was fucking howling because I'd never heard any of them before of course I can't remember any of them now but it was brilliant well so if they were doing some of those the ones that I really enjoy is uh whenever um Brian Bosworth's character you know pops up they always call him asshole and then whenever susan sarandon <laughs> pops up she's slut uh, slut yeah <laughs> but at the beginning of the film if they yell out slut whenever she pops out sometimes some people will respond with not yet but she will be soon <laughs> and i had not like i had been to a couple of screenings and that was the first time that i had heard that response to calling her a slut you know i th- i think yeah but i think those responses happen more in the theater productions than in the quote alongs because there's space for them and the Obviously, the actors then no responses as well, or, or they'll call them back. So, like, we went to that kind of a production, and it was brilliant. Well, and I, I just can't remember any of the lines. They did three showings of movie parties of Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, or actually four in total. <laughs> they did two per night, and they had wow. two different nights of it at two different locations. The staff uh, who were, like, the waiters and waitresses were all dressed up in Rocky Horror garb for that theater. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> the people that showed up were all dressed up in that. And then they had folks that had actually obviously done stage productions of it because like they, they did the the bits where they would uh, run up and pretend like they were spinning the screen whenever stuff spins and oh, okay. like everything that it was like, it was like basically this wonderful, beautiful amalgamation of the stage show stuff. And then like the normal theatrical craziness that you would get whenever you would watch it theatrically with an audience. It was just this Brilliant. beautiful mishmash that worked so wonderful, and it was such an amazing night. I had so much fun there. I also got the worst cold I've ever gotten from that night. <laughs> oh, don't. <laughs> no doubt, because of all the stuff being thrown around and everything, but it's totally worth it. <laughs> it took a few days, um, so um, luckily I got better in time. <laughs> cool. uh, the next night... I have, a, I have a full Eddie costume next door. Nice. Leather jacket. I did the, I did the work. <laughs> That's the fucking scar awesome. on the forehead. <laughs> Dyed a t-shirt. I even had the rings on the fingers. I fucking went to town. That's amazing. <laughs> the next night was probably the most fun for me and also probably embarrassing for my wife because it was the Army of Darkness movie party. Uh, Yay. Not much in props, but they did give you a foam chainsaw you could put on your hand like those big stadium fingers. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> the Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street movie party, they gave you a Freddy glove like that, and then you got a bunch of stay awake uh, quote unquote stay awake pills, which was just basically a pill bottle filled with uh, like jelly beans. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was the prop there. I'm just sort of remembering stuff as I go. Um, you've, you've seen my Skype tagline here, yeah? No. <laughs> um, the only thing that I can really see is the picture, the image right there. So. Oh, okay. The, the, it allows you to put like a status, and mine is permanently, it's a trick, get an axe. <laughs> yeah, so I was doing the quote along, and I was basically quoting every single line. Like, everybody, <laughs> all the responses, I had the affectations right. Um, <laughs> Sally, ha, ha. Yeah. Uh, and I said it on my show when I did it on Cinema PsyOps, and Matt fucked up his notes really bad, fucked everything up, showed up drunk on the recording and just basically ruined the show but i saved it from the fact that i had the movie memorized (laughs) he was convinced he didn't have to take notes because he had the movie memorized and he absolutely did not and i'm the one that ended up telling him what he did wrong as he was doing it (laughs) it's it's a fun show for people to listen to it was really excruciating to (laughs) record (laughs) was it was it the extended cut or the normal one uh we just did the normal one because that's the one that he thinks he has memorized um I, I get the, the one that annoy the extended cut kind of annoys me. I don't like the stupid little Bruce's in the mirror bit. It it goes on too long. Oh, um, my only problem with the extended version, because I enjoy that stuff, is they fucked up the line where he shoots evil Ash in the face. Instead of saying good, bad, I'm the guy with the gun, he just says I'm not that good, which is not the better line. No, it's not. Yeah. So <laughs> what I ended up doing is I made my own version of an extended cut. Um, ages and ages ago, I put them all together to where they flow as one continuous film. <laughs> which is possible nice. and i had described how i did it um and what i ended up doing was putting that line back in after he shoots evil ash and then left pretty much everything the same but i had the um shop smart shop s smart ending where he's back in the store being actually mm. a dream and then when he says hail to the king babe and he goes to kiss her then i have him wake up in the post-apocalyptic world 
Nice. Yeah. So that, that's a good idea. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Anybody <laughs> wants to make a supercut, that's how you do it. And if you want to know how to put Evil Dead One and Two together, I'll tell you how to do that too. <laughs> um, next night was the Peter Cushing star film Shockwaves: Nazi Zombies in the Ocean. Ever seen it? Don't know it. No. It's all right. You know, it's old. Of course, I haven't. It's got Peter Cushing in it. <laughs> Not my favorite movie in the entire world, but uh, definitely pretty fucking cool. And anybody who's seen the movie Meatballs has seen at least a portion of Shockwaves because in Meatballs, the original movie, they're watching Shockwaves as the movie night movie on, in the camp. Um, you'll you'll oh, actually right. see the zombies and their goggles coming up out of the ocean in Meatballs. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next night was a double feature Friday night. I went by myself. I drink your blood. I eat your skin. It's as bad as everybody <laughs> thinks it is. Okay. Um, there, uh, I can't remember which one it is. Uh, I think it's I Drink Your Blood. Yes. It, Not familiar. I, yeah, it's uh, I Drink Your Blood. Um, I Drink Your Blood is the movie that stars Lynn Lowry. Um, most folks would probably know her from David Cronenberg's Shivers, um, George Romero's The Crazies, uh, a few other films. Um, I can't remember off the top. Sugar Cookies, which is like a sexploitation type film that she was in. Oh, you'd know that then. <laughs> yeah, I own it. <laughs> but uh, I Drink Your Blood is basically um, this gang of evil hippies, sort of like Manson clone, Manson family clones, um, happen upon this town because they're hitchhiking across the country. They move into an abandoned house. Uh, they're like a satanic cult. They start doing all this weird shit. Uh, they beat up this kid's grandpa and rape his sister because the grandpa's trying to stop them from raping the sister or something like that. Um, or no, no, she comes back after being raped and they let her go. And then the grandpa goes to confront them and gets the shit kicked out of him. And he's a veterinarian. So his son decides, or grandson decides to give all of these hippies rabies by, he finds a dead rabbit animal that he killed and then grabs a syringe and takes the blood from the animal that's rabid and injects it all into these meat pies that he then makes sure that he sells to the hippie cult. They go ahead and eat it, so this satanic evil hippie cult all becomes crazy rabid and starts going even more insane, and it's sort of like a zombie movie. Um, okay. It's gory, it's crazy, um, and it's just really, really bizarre. And that's the movie that I was waiting for, but since I drink your blood, I eat your skin, they actually played it in reverse. It should be played how it's billed. Because I was planning on watching I Drink Your Blood and Going Home. Because I've right. seen I Eat Your Skin and it's not my bag. It's more art film than anything. <laughs> okay. um, but I stayed for the whole thing. I made it and now we're almost done. Dismembering the Alamo was the night of our Halloween, our, our Halloween party, so we didn't go. Um, right. The next night I was not feeling well because, so I didn't go out. <laughs> <laughs> what was your costume this year? Um, oh Jesus, what did I do this year? I can't even remember. Okay. Well, last year. Last year. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, this okay, last year. Um, the, <laughs> satanic pr- fucking long. the satanic priest was the year before. Let me see if I have a photo. Nope. There was, there was one with a rebreather. I thought that was last year. That was, oh, no, that was like two or three years ago that I built that. Oh, my God, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have used that on occasion. <laughs> This is right now. Be quite handy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually thought about converting that, dude. No, no shit. I, I actually yeah. shopping at the supermarket. And I, I, I know loads of people who want to get the old um, beaked doctor's mask thing and go shopping with one of those on. I've seen people um, run around and wear. Okay, yes. So I made a. Uh, I, I call it a traumatic weight loss. Is the the, the costume was the idea? Um, I made it look like the front half of me was cut off, and it was kind of a tribute to the weight loss that I had. <laughs> nice. So I molded Genius. I molded a rib cage and guts and all of that kind of stuff, and I just made it look like like where my the shelf of my gut would have been just got sliced off, and there's just ribs and guts underneath, and that's it. Brilliant. And I called it like traumatic weight loss, and I was going to do more than that, but because of all the movies, I ran out of time, and I just wanted to do something fun and gross, and there we go. Mm. And that's what I ended up doing. That's why I couldn't remember it because I was like, what did I do? And I, it's, it was such a busy month. Um, yeah. And I, I can post pictures of that if anybody wants to see, but I have posted it <laughs> online if you want to go back as well. Um, so the... We're going to need a group for all these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, the last three nights um, was a screening of Cutting Class, which unfortunately it was fucked up. We weren't able to see. The file was corrupted. Oh, uh, that's happening a lot these days. We had that... Uh, Fright Fest Glasgow this year. They gave us... Digital was not all it's cut out to be. They gave us free passes. Oh, that's good. And not only that, they comped our drinks and our food, and then they 
gave us basically a pass for another show and then gave us um like they gave us basically two shows free from that one fuck up wow yeah uh then the next night it actually happened again when we went to go see in in fabric uh we didn't get to see it because that was fucked up (sighs) so we got sad faces or angry faces that we missed it but again they fixed it for us they gave us a viewing now and we went and saw the second Zombieland film, which was okay. It was not horrible. And then we got free passes, which we used again later. And then on Halloween night, we hmm. went to see a screening of Beetlejuice as a movie party. And the <laughs> host of that decided he was going to get married on Halloween in front of the whole crowd with Beetlejuice because he and his wife love it. So we were, su- wow. we were subject to being forced to watch his wedding before we could watch the movie. Amazing. <laughs> right? But I also wanted to just fucking see the movie, dude. I don't want to be at your wedding. <laughs> but. Yeah, that's a narcissistic move ever. <laughs> but I will say this. He was dressed as uh, he found a tux that looked exactly like what um, Beetlejuice was wearing when he was marrying Lydia. And his yeah. bride was dressed um, not in the dress that Lydia wore, but as the she was able to replicate and find the dress that Gina Davis's character wore. Um, for her nice. wedding dress so she had that and then like the the <laughs> guests were all dressed like her their guests were all dressed up for beetlejuice and everything like that as well so yeah Brilliant. it's kind of cool but at the same time again why force a whole entire audience to be at your wedding <laughs> it, it, it's an odd choice oh and bev's like oh it's so romantic and i was exactly the same as you i'm like that's fucking narcissistic <laughs> but it's like if you could rattle it off in five minutes that's great but like wedding ceremonies are usually at least half an hour maybe an hour long <laughs> so, they made it relatively quick but not quick enough quick for enough. my taste <laughs> get the fuck out yeah uh, right and i get i'm happy for you but bugger off <laughs> right like congratulations you're gonna regret this later on in your life um but you know congratulations <laughs> Oh, and the guy that runs it also has a podcast, which I won't name, but he also uses every hosting opportunity to shill his podcast, and he made sure not to skip that before the wedding actually happened. He shilled his podcast (laughs) right before the wedding happened. (laughs) It makes me feel better. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I mean, like, I'm relatively shameless, but I don't hand out my card or mention that I have a podcast at any... None of the screenings I did, unless... Like, I've worn my... I would wear my, uh, my vest... Uh, my battle mm-hmm. vest that I made that has the Cinema PsyOps logo on the back. And if somebody asked me what that was, I'd explain to them it's a podcast and I'm the host and tell them how to find it. But I don't go out of my way to be like, so I got a podcast, I got a podcast, because like I feel like every fucking middle-aged white dude does that. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, n- nowadays it's so much worse. I- I'm more reluctant than I used to be. I used to go to Friday first with cards and t-shirt trying to think, well, this is the crowd who might listen, you know? It's just- Maybe, yeah, I just thought, nah, people avoided me like the plague when I was doing that. Although I do occasionally still, I don't have many horror t-shirts, weirdly. So, um, you know, a five-day event, one of those days, I'm going to be wearing my little pot of horrors t-shirt. And, um, you know, last year it got um, a conversation going with a guy called Paddy Murphy, who's a film director, who's done some, his last film, Pe- The Perished, um, has done great business. I'm I'm waiting to see where it lands VOD-wise and so on. Um, I know it's had its uh, DVD release, uh, I think DVD, Blu-ray, and I'm going to hang myself on not having the correct information to hand, but um, yeah, it's 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 a very, it's risky subject matter, and he's done a great job of it, and um, yeah, he <laughs> just saw my t-shirt, he's like, dude, I love your t-shirt, and I was like, oh yeah, it's my, it's my podcast, I, went, I love podcasts, what podcast is it, so, and then it turns out we were friends on Facebook already, but yeah, weird. Um, uh, he That's pretty awesome, had, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, that is Fright Fest. You're unwittingly next to like, like I went to Fright Fest Glasgow in February this year, since obviously we last spoke, and I was really late. It was a last minute thing. I flew in halfway through the first day of films, basically rushed to the cinema, ran in sort of ten minutes late for the film. The festival director. She's like, oh, they're really funny about people going in late. And I'm like, literally, I've just come from the south of England and I'm now in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, I've really tried to get here on time. And the director of the festival, she came in, oh, no, it's fine, sweetie. And I said, oh, and I need to leave my bag somewhere because I've got all my luggage. I'm really sorry. She went, he's going to take that to the office. I'm going to let you into the cinema. I was like, 
they were amazing. And I go in, I go to my allocated seat, and there's this sort of scruffy Nerf Herder guy sitting there. And uh, I, that's a Star Wars reference, by the way. You wouldn't know. Um, no, I, I understood that. Re- <laughs> I'm like Captain America. I understood that. I understood that reference. I got that. Okay, fine. Um, I said, yeah, excuse me. He was like, oh, yeah, he sat down. And then I sat through this whole movie, and we sort of chuckled along, watched it, and then he got up and walked away. And then I uh, realized later on it was Joe Bagos who was sitting next to me. Anyway. <clears throat> Wait, so Joe Bagos was sitting next to you, or the guy you kicked out, Joe Bagos? No, no, he was he was sitting in the seat next to me in basically my friend's seat. He wasn't there because he had to be somewhere else. So like he'd come in and because he was a guest of the festival, they just take a vacant seat when they see one sort of thing. Oh, nice. Um, Wonder if you kicked yeah, out and... another director, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> like you unwittingly <laughs> like insulted a director. But it's just like one of those things. Like, um, the way I've done that before. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but it's not like I would have said anything, but it's just like if I'd um, at least shown some kind of recognition, it would have been a bit more respectful seeing as I've been there at like two of his previous film premieres. I know what he looks like, but I was so flustered and I just so didn't want to be disturbing anyone. And I felt so bad that I made him sort of shuffle to move to let me in um, that I just sort of sat there in my own space feeling self-conscious for the whole movie. <laughs> like... The whole time you're sitting next to him, you're going, God damn it, this is the guy who directed VFW. <laughs> yeah well i hadn't seen it yet because that was the uh the climax of the festival but um yeah when he came out with two bottles of whiskey and said we're giving everybody shots i was like oh you were sitting here <laughs> so, uh i love those festivals anyway no sorry just hijacked your point there no i was done that was the last one um, that was the last one oh, okay, that I, right. I already described so that was the draft house of horrors um it was an amazing endurance run and it basically forced Halloween to be more about me enjoying the month and enjoying the holiday as opposed to stressing over getting the Halloween party together and ready and perfect. Um, Mm. And it's exactly what I needed because I really wanted to just stop doing the Halloween parties because it became about, you know, making sure everything was right for everybody else. And this is my fucking holiday. And just because you (laughs) want to get drunk in costume doesn't mean it's yours. Yeah. No, I get you. I, we don't even have the parties here, so I mean, like Halloween is a big nothing still. Um, so that's why I go to Fright Fest Halloween. It's just a one day movie marathon type thing. Um, that's sort of my my Halloween celebration, really. Well, and I um, I would totally love to do a movie marathon as my celebration, but it's become this institution. My Halloween party has become an institution, and I have no control um, over whether or not <laughs> it's going to happen anymore because my wife wants it to happen, and everybody expects it. So now. It just has to be, you know, I got no other choice. <laughs> oh, this is a great event to wrap around. It. I'm kind of jealous. I wish I had something on my doorstep like that. But um, I mean, there probably is. It's just in London and I hate London. Anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm hoping that things will mm, come back to a point where this October I'll be able to do Draft House of Horrors again. Um, mm. I had been talking about and we can kind of like this is, goes back to the last episode or the episode where we initially discussed that we were doing this, um, and this will kind of be a good thing to wrap it up on. Right before the pandemic hit, um, Mm. the subscription service for theaters for Alamo Drafthouse premiered here in Omaha. And for roughly three to four weeks, we were able to use it, and we were back at the cinemas regularly um, watching Mm. movies in theater with uh, this. It's basically you pay a monthly fee. I think it's like close to 20 bucks. They pro they have a processing fee for the tickets that they charge you, which is like one or two bucks, basically yeah. just to cover whatever the costs are for your seat or anything like that. Um, and then you get a digital ticket that once you're on, it's locked to your phone, so you can't give it to somebody else. Um, mm. And then once you go to that screening with the you know the 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 digital ticket, then becomes your ticket. You can take your seat and everything like that. We used it pretty regularly. I was really enjoying it. I was super stoked. I was really, really happy. And we used it probably for about a month, and then the shit hit the fan, and they were going to close the theaters. But right before the announcement came that they were closing all the Alamo draft houses due to the pandemic, they emailed us and said, hey, we have to close the theaters down. We are immediately halting the subscription. We are prorating it back, so you will see the amount that you were charged to be prorated back for the amount of time. Um, you know, it's it's 20 bucks a month, so even if they just stopped it and I don't have to pay for the next month, I was fine because I actually got to use it. But they actually, like from the point that they decided they had to close the theaters 
forward they prorated it and so we you know they gave us some money back on that and then they said you don't have to do anything as soon as we are able to open our theaters back up we will automatically start your subscription back up and you will be ready and raring to go as soon as we can open the theaters and we hope to see you there and i'm like i know that i'm kind of a shill for the draft house at this point but it is my favorite chain of theaters in the states uh, and it's the reason that I actually can endure living in Omaha because we have not one but two locations, and so that that multi pass thing that you can go to multiple shows, one show a day basically for for the monthly fee, um, mm. it it can, it can be used at both locations. So I could, I mean, I can't use one in one location and then on the same day go to the other location because that that doesn't work. But mm. I could go to one location one day, go to another special screening if it's part of the package on another day or something like that. You know, like when I say special, I don't mean like an extra money, but like uh, Art House Revival or anything like that. I, I got the options to go and do all of this stuff. And what it removes is the, fee, the, the fear of, well, this is going to cost me 10 bucks to go see this movie. Is it really worth it? Yeah. What it is now is this is going to cost me two bucks and the gas to get there. And mm -hmm. I got my monthly subscription fee, so I'm going to be even more likely to, to just, just give a film a chance for a theater experience whenever this op if and when this opens back up. Yeah, we we rinsed ours to the last second with um, our Odeon subscription, which works in a similar fashion. Um, I think they cancelled ours pretty readily as well. Um, well, you know, once they locked down, but we I think we were probably the last few people in the cinema because it, it literally closed the next day. Um, and the hunt is the last thing we saw in there, which I really enjoyed actually. So I was actually um, able to see the hunt. Um, and I've seen a lot of the movies that were in theaters. One of the last things that my wife and I got to see was the invisible man. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did you like it? Um, I hear your complaints, but you also have to understand that not everybody knows self-defense like you do. <laughs> you heard my review. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, while your points are valid, <laughs> for someone who is not really that well at self-defense which elizabeth moss character has has clearly not been she just had to do subterfuge and was basically just trying to learn as she went and she did learn as she went and she did learn to defend herself by the end of the film now the guy who was like a cop your arguments are absolutely valid of everything yeah. about he got his ass handed to him but he's also a cop and as we all know from my show they're bumbling dummies <laughs> i mean the, uh, it once or twice, fine. But when it reached four, five, six, I'd lost my patience. Um, otherwise, it was okay. It like was well done. Um, I like the concept. I like the weird suit. I like you know all that kind of stuff. But I fucking there were just too many dumb moments. The suit that is a simultaneous camera and like virtual reality projector, like yeah. you know, that's covered with all of these cameras and projectors, and like has a way of canceling the noise whenever you move. It's all fucking brilliant. Like I <laughs> yes. really love that part of it. I agree mm -hmm. there's some meandering stuff where they tried to build tension that just doesn't quite work. But what works really well for me is the sadistic glee with which someone who cannot be seen fucks with someone else. The stuff at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I understand your arguments for the fights, and I believe they are 100% valid, except for the stuff with Elizabeth Moss being attacked, because she obviously, her character didn't know how to defend herself quite yet. And she learns that's the journey of a final girl. That's, that's okay. how it works. The cop, you're absolutely that right. Point. That was fucking ridiculous. But the scene... All I would say is, I would challenge anyone, put an invisible suit on, and attack my wife in the same way, who has never had any martial arts experience, and let, let, let's see how well you do. That's all I'm saying. Yes, but there are I'm some sitting... folks that are just natural fighters, and <laughs> yeah. Lavinia clearly is a natural badass. She would fuck you up. <laughs> I believe that. That's that's why the Invisible Man would have been a 30-second short had he attacked Lavinia. <laughs> uh, the, the last yeah. thing I want to say about the Invisible Man, uh, just, just kind of real quick, uh, the stuff where he's moving things around and setting it up to make it look like she's doing all of these horrible things, that stuff was all brilliant, particularly um, the way in which uh, framing for grievous bodily harm and or murder is done. It's just so fucking incredible. The scene that that mm -hmm. happens when I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but whenever that happens, the, the scene in the restaurant with grievous bodily oh, harm, that, that fucking made me cringe because it was so yeah. fast and so sudden. And I was shocked. And like mm. both my wife and myself had our mouth, like our hands over our mouths and went, 
when that happened. Yeah, and that's, we did as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that scene made me forgive everything else that I would have had a problem with after that because it was so well executed that I was like rose colored glasses for the rest of the movie. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I can't argue with that at all. Okay, now the hunt, since we've both seen it and we can kind of briefly talk about it. Mm. Oh my fucking god, that movie is so fucking cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> the guns, the death, the brutality, um uh Liberty Bell from the Yeah, Glow. Liberty Bell. <laughs> I don't know that actress's name. I can't remember the character's name, but I always know her as Liberty Bell. Yeah. Uh, I expect big things from her as far as an action heroine goes. She is fucking mm. amazing. Her physicality is on par. And I one hundred fight scene at the end. Fucking yeah. Hell. I one hundred percent believe that she could kick an ex military guy's ass. Like I did. Like the yeah. way she mm. fucking handled everybody was amazing. And but just, it, but she's got that that it's that distant, far away hmm, kind of away with the fairies kind of feel that she has to her. But then she's absolutely lethal as well. I love that juxtaposition. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, she looks like she wants to talk to you about her latest crocheting project. <laughs> yeah. But when it's time to throw down, she will fucking end you. And yeah. it's so brilliant. Like this actress is really fucking talented. I want to see oh, her yeah. team up with Samara Weaving and just like go on an ass kicking spree in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, um, speaking uh, of Samara some... Weaving, have you seen Guns Akimbo mm. yet? Uh not yet, no. I'm five, six minutes in as far as I've managed. <laughs> so <laughs> Aw. Okay. Well, uh, I'm a big we... fan of that and I know you got a copy of it somewhere, don't you? Uh maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening uh just enough hours in the day is what i'm looking for at this point right and we both seen vfw we fucking yeah. both love vfw i love that film it is a love song to john carpenter's assault on precinct 13 by way of uh hobo with a shotgun just just don't say that to joe bagos he won't be very happy with you um <laughs> so... does he hate hobo with a shotgun no he didn't appreciate the <sighs> somebody asked him is it the uh... If if this is if that film was your blah 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 and this film's your blah 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 this film is your carpenter tribute then and he's like well you know I can't remember exactly what his response was I could put it in there because I've got audio of it but he wasn't too impressed by the question I think he keeps getting compared to Assault and Precinct Thirteen and he's like well no this is just this is my thing <laughs> um, and I and I think if you the best explanation of this I heard was Issa Lopez, who uh, Lopez, sorry, who did Tigers Are Not Afraid, and people keep comparing her work to Guillermo del Toro's, and she said it was completely unintentional. When you grow up with something, it seeps into your being, and then when you in turn create something, it comes back out. It, I never intended that, but that's what happened because he was so influential in my life, and I think if Joe was a bit more articulate in that moment, that's probably what he would have said. Um, in response in that yes it was probably an influence but was he intentionally doing this is my carpenter no he was just doing what he does in the style that he does it it just happens that he's sort of a modern day version okay albeit that's not as good if some would say but th that's absolutely fine but i will say this when i was watching it i had the same like glee and just over the top joy that i got from the first time that i watched assault on precinct 13 as a kid Okay. <laughs> he activated that in a 40-year-old man. Now, see, if the, if the question had been presented to him in those terms, it would have been a much more favorable response, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so. The only reason I feel like it's getting compared to that is because it is a brutal fucking siege film where experienced veteran fighters have to deal with a an out-of-control like <laughs> gang of mo mutant freaks in some yeah. way, shape, or form. And, mm. of course, that's going to draw comparisons because that's where your mind is going to go. But the only reason that I say that is because that was kind of the jumping off point, because that's basically what it is. But I believe that VFW goes far beyond that. Um, the mm -hmm. cast is the reason for that film. All of the old men and their dialogue is fucking amazing. The joke yeah. about the toothpicks makes me laugh my ass off still. I can't remember it. Uh, oh, that's so bad. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I won't it was really, a long weekend that it's weekend. not really going to spoil it. Um, there's a sequence where they're talking about, or they're talking of a photo of a naked lady that they're going to go see this stripper for yes. whatever reasons. And I don't want to spoil too much. But um, Fred Williamson's character says, why'd she shave off all her pussy hairs? And he okay. says that he likes pussy hairs. Why did she do that? And um, she's like, and I, I believe uh, Lang's character, Stephen Lang's character says, 
well, it's her pussy. Why, why can't she shave? It's her pussy hairs. Why can't she shave them off? And he's like, but that's wrong. I like that or something like that. And then he talks about how he used to buy toothpicks in gross right after that, meaning that he liked to munch the carpet and he really enjoyed having the hair get stuck in his teeth. You know, <laughs> like that was something that he got off on. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. So that toothpick joke, like him mentioning how he bought toothpicks in gross, it keeps coming back. And one of the, t- one of the other times that I absolutely loved is, um, the new vet who just got in and just went straight to the VFW bar, who's a vet from four yeah. or more and gets accepted mm. with open arms. Um, they asked him if he's got a baby mama and he says, no, he's got a wife. And the guy who asked him if he has a baby mama, uh, is Fred Williamson's character. And he aut- automatically retorts with, you got any extra toothpicks? And when he <laughs> says that he has a wife, <laughs> I just love that callback. And I guess you yeah. said, or in the interview, I'd heard that uh, Joe Bagos had said that that was all improvised dialogue, which is even more incredible that those actors worked it all out themselves. They knew what they were going to say. And it does flow organically. And it feels very much like a bunch of dirty old bastards sitting around and getting drunk at a bar talking. <laughs> It really does, and I, I that is why I asked that question because it was so it was so uh, I don't know natural organic on screen. I, I was like, I wanted to know if he'd had to try and cultivate that if it was natural, if it was happening off camera, and I, that was a question I asked: was did that chemistry was that all the way through production? And you know that's when he said, you know, a lot of it was on the fly. So uh, yeah, it made me love that film even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you have actors of that caliber, like all of the vets are, are amazing actors of a very serious mm. caliber, and they've all been excellent in everything that they're in, regardless of whatever levels their career have, have, have gone. But they're all fucking amazing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the way that they play off of each other, it's like they had been friends for like ever, and they're really, really good together. And mm. I'm focusing in on that because like I, haven't, I, can, I can't even begin to gush about the fucking violence that's in this. <laughs> It's yeah. it's almost too bloody for me, like almost <laughs> like to, to the point where it almost becomes like to parody, but they dial it back from the point where it's parody to the point like it's just 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 below parody where it's disgusting to the point where it's just below funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just so fucking violent, but it's so realistic at the same time that it like it takes it down from being like humorous and enjoyable. Like when the mm. violence hits, it's like really visceral and Fuck. gross yeah, yeah it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i love but it, gives it. You, it it gives you an emotional investment though that wouldn't be there otherwise i i i thought the i thought he hit the balance perfectly it's i i haven't seen all of his movies but of his movies that is his best work to date in, in my opinion see this is uh, the first bigos film that i've seen and i've heard people rave about bliss and have you seen that and should i go back and check that out uh you should um simply because it's one of those that splits opinion. I need to give it a rewatch. I saw it tired at Fright Fest, um, and I think I enjoyed it. It's it's very full on. It's quite a kinetic movie. You've got to be in the mood for something like that. I think it will depend on where you're at as to how much you enjoy it. But I know people who, like Scott and Liam, for example, fucking love that movie. Like, they almost spaffed over joe when they saw him about it <laughs> i nearly had to tear them away from him but um <laughs> it was they were so keen to say how much they enjoyed it when when they got to sort of walk by him um i think, I think they promised to buy him a beer uh which they duly did so uh, <laughs> um, so yeah but, you know they're an example of people who were absolutely blown away by it it to me it had really good elements but i didn't find the depth in it that perhaps others have Uh, My favorite, other than that, is The Mind's Eye. I really enjoyed it. It was like Scanners dialed up to 11. Um, And I always thought Scanners was quite a... It's a very spaced out film, (laughs) in terms of pacing. Um, Mind's Eye is just more of the same with higher violence (laughs) and and more frequent incidents of it. Okay, so So, I need to get my hands on more Bego stuff for the next Bullshit Artist so we can kind of go over some of those and we'll both revisit whatever like I'll visit and you can revisit some of them. Yeah, cool, we'll do that. Yeah. Um, And the Almost Human I think was his other one. Is it Almost Human? Something like that. I need to find that one and see it. Um, Because I think it was his first feature. Um, And there's one other which I can't remember right now. Because I think it's yeah, yeah. Anyway. We can look at his back catalog. <laughs> yeah, it'd be an ex- exciting little experiment since our minds align so well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. 
Right, so with no more... <laughs> um, <laughs> we should probably wrap that up. I'm not going to bring that in every week because it will be fucking annoying. Um, but <laughs> every week, like we're going to do this once a week. Well, maybe we uh, can now. <laughs> every, every week there is a show, is what I meant. Um, <laughs> every <laughs> space that they may be. Yes, <laughs> every happening. Um, yeah, so I thought that might go long. Uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> I still stand by that you could turn this into two episodes if you wanted to. I could. B U double L S H I T. New word. A R T I S T. Bell's bullshit artist. <laughs> <laughs>